Okay, everybody can see chapter nine, airway management up on the screen? Yep. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, doke. Okay, so we're gonna move away now. Well, I keep on thinking we're gonna move away from anatomy and physiology, but we're gonna review the airway, uh, airway anatomy and, and physiology in a second, but we're gonna get into the actual management now of the airway emergencies using the different uh, airway devices and everything. And we'll talk about how to ventilate patients with the bag valve mask and so on and so on tonight. So it's a, a lot of material. Um, so we'll go, th we'll go through it slow and make sure that we, uh, we cover everything that needs to get covered. Okay. 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 So we know just again, real quick, because we've probably done this at least three or four times already. We know that our airway is the pathway that air enters our body, right? And it starts with choosing to either breathe through your nose or your mouth. Okay. And we said that the advantage of breathing through your nose, okay, is that the air is warm, humidified, and cleaned. Okay. And we don't get that uh, by breathing through the mouth. So it's preferable to breathe through the nose. Okay. Then it moves from your mouth and nose into your pharynx. And we said there's three divisions to your throat, right? Your pharynx is the, the medical term for, um, for throat or the anatomical term for a throat. So the oropharynx is the part behind your mouth. Nasopharynx is the part behind your nose. And the laryngopharynx, okay, which they also call the hyperpharynx because hypo... Hold on for a second. Let me just mute everybody. Okay. And your, your hypopharynx or laryngopharynx is the bottom of your throat right above your trachea, right? Right above your larynx. So we said your larynx is the, ter is the term for the structure on the top of your trachea. We'll see if we try a second. Yeah. Okay. So hold on. Good. So I, I just muted everybody. So whoever was trying to ask a question, just unmute yourself. Okay, and that the top of the trachea, so the larynx is the top of the trachea, the opening into that larynx or the top of the trachea is called your glottic opening. And sitting right above your glottic opening is your epiglottis, which is the flap that we know that protects our airway. And that when we swallow, the trachea rises towards the epiglottis, the epiglottis goes towards the trachea, and it basically closes off the opening to your airway when you're swallowing, so that the food and water goes posteriorly to the back to the esophagus, right? So that's how normally we would start to breathe. So we're talking about, again, the benefit of breathing through your nose, okay, whoops, versus through your mouth, and that your tongue pretty much fills up most of your mouth. You see the tongue is just really a muscle, okay? Your tongue is attached to your lower jaw, which is called your mandible, okay? And that when we're gonna be talking about airway maneuvers, sometimes when someone's unconscious, especially if they're lying uh, supine on their back, that the tongue will relax and fall backwards and obstruct their airway. The sound of a tongue partially obstructing the airway is called snoring, right? And if we hear somebody with snoring respirations, we have to do our head tilt chin lift or whatever maneuver we're gonna do to be able to move it. So air comes in through your nasal passageway, your nose, your nares, whatever you wanna call it, or your mouth. After it comes through your nose, it goes into your nasopharynx and you see it has the turbinates or shelves that make the air spin around so that the pollution is caught in the hair and the mucus, okay? Behind your mouth, it's called the oropharynx, your throat, and then right above your glottic opening. This is your glottic opening, it's the top of the trachea. This is your thyroid cartilage. Did you see in the front of the neck or the Adam's apple, okay? So right above that is called your laryngopharynx, okay? And then now you have a choice, right? Your throat splits into two tubes. Your anterior tube is your trachea, sitting right on top of your trachea is your, is your um, larynx, okay? Or your voice box where your vocal cords are. And posteriorly is your esophagus. Most of the times the esophagus is actually flat. It's just a muscular tube made out of smooth muscle that when food enters it, it starts to actually move and squeeze the food down. You see your spinal vertebrae that make up your cervical spine. And remember we said that there's seven vertebrae. Let's, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So seven vertebrae or seven bones making up your cervical spine, okay? And that running through your spinal column or bones is your spinal cord or nerve, right? These little blue lines here are the cushioning discs that you know, it kind of act like a shock absorber. So when people say they have like bad backs, it's because typically they were overweight or maybe because of the type of work they do, 
they wore away these discs prematurely, and now you have muscle grinding, I'm sorry, bone grinding on bone. And also I said that every separation, there's a nerves, two nerves that come out. So again, if the bones are pressing on each other, they're gonna be pressing on the nerves. And that's why people have back problems or, or spine problems. Um, that's what happens. Somebody asked, what is a um, split disc? I did turn on the recording, right? Hold on for one second. Let me just make sure I can screw that up again. Yeah, I did. Okay. When somebody said, what's a slip disc? So these vertebrae, okay, are obviously in a straight line, right? Going down. So a slip disc, and they're held in place with ligaments, right? Because we said ligaments are what always holds joints together. So each one of these separations is, is considered a joint. So there's ligaments that hold it in place. And what happens is, you know, from numerous different reasons, the, the ligaments are not holding them into place. And now instead of these bones sitting one on top of the other, one goes a little sideways. And again, once it's out of alignment, it's going to put pressure, okay, on either the disc, the cushion between it, or the nerves that are coming out. Okay, so from an airway standpoint, air enters our trachea. We know our trachea is held open by rings of cartilage, okay, and it goes down into our lungs, right, after that. So, okay, so the lower airway, okay, is your trachea, your right and left main stem bronchus into your smaller bronchioles, okay? And then all those bronchioles end at the alveoli. So we're looking at here, right? So this is your actual trachea. And this is the structure that sits on top of the trachea that's called your larynx. On top of your larynx is your epiglottis, right? That's stopping, that's the flap that's gonna stop things from coming down in to your airway, right? The only thing that should be coming into your airway should be um, air. So food and water would go behind it posteriorly into the esophagus. So here's your trachea. Your trachea splits or bifurcates into your right and left main stem bronchus. And the last time we looked at this, I pointed out, if you remember, that the right main stem bronchus tends to drop straight, almost like straighter down than the left. The left goes a little horizontal or sideways. And most of the times when people aspirate, remember aspiration, is the term for getting something into your lungs, into your airway, other than air. So it could be food, it could be water, it could be vomitous, you know, somebody throws up, it could be blood, you know, it could be a, a, a toy, a little, a little round something or other, right? So it could be anything. Um, it gets in. Most of the times what happens is it comes down and actually falls towards the right side versus the left side, okay? And then you see how your right and left main stem bronchus then split into smaller and smaller and smaller bronchioles and at the end of all these terminal bronchioles are where you have your alveoli, right? And your alveoli are the structures where gas exchange takes place and wrapped around the alveoli, we said are the pulmonary capillaries. And that's how we have oxygen and carbon dioxide moving in and out of our bloodstream, okay? So again, grape-like bunches, but they're not bags, right? They're, they're bags with multiple bags or multiple walls inside of them, rooms inside of them, because in each one of those little uh, bags, there's multiple little spaces for more gas exchange to take place. And again, they're surrounded by the pulmonary capillaries, okay? So there's always a test question that says, you know, where does gas exchange in the lungs takes place? It takes place between the pulmonary capillaries and the alveoli, okay? And again, the two gases we're talking about when we're talking about respiration in the lungs is oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen is what we're bringing in from the room around us and carbon dioxide is what we're taking out of the bloodstream, out of the pulmonary capillaries because that was the waste product of, um, that was the waste product of the cells using the oxygen, okay, to make energy. Okay, and again, if you have any questions, just interrupt. So this is showing you a good cross section of how the alveoli actually are, right? They're not just one big sac, but there are multiple little sacs inside of that one big sac, so there's more area for gas exchange. Okay, and then wrapped around, each one of these um, is a, um, um, sorry, wrapped around these are the pulmonary capillaries. Okay, so I'm trying to pay attention to people as they're trying to sign in. Okay, so now from a, a standpoint of problems, right? So pathophysiology always means the problems. Physiology is the, the function and pathophysiology is when there's problems with it, okay? So obviously the problem with airway is that something's blocking it. Something's not letting air get in and out of the body, okay? So we could have situations where it happens suddenly, which is called acute, right? And that means it could be foreign bodies, it could be food, it could be um, 
toys, candy, whatever. It could be stuff from the pa inside the patient themselves, vomit, blood. Okay, it could be um, their tongue, right? So there's a lot of different things. Now, when they're talking about acute, they mean it's happened suddenly, and then they're saying that it takes a little longer to develop. So if somebody were to breathe in superheated air, uh, steam or hot air from like a fire, it could cause a burn on the inside of the airway, it could cause swelling. Now, it's not like this is going to take three days to develop, but it's usually not immediate. It usually takes, you know, a few minutes to an hour to develop. Somebody strikes the outside of their neck on something. Uh, the classic thing is always, you know, you have the parking lot with the chain going across it, and somebody's riding a bicycle or a motorcycle and doesn't see the chain gets hit in the neck, right? And it can cause a fracture of the bones of the larynx, okay? Infection. So you've all had strep throat, right? That's an infection in the airway. It becomes difficult to swallow. So you could have strep throat that becomes life-threatening, or you could have another... Um, emergency or infection called epiglottitis, where the epiglottis swells. So we're going to talk about that as we go on, but there's infectious. Now, obviously, there really is little we could do, okay, for a burn or trauma or infection. This is a hospital type of thing. The paramedics, if they see somebody who has airway burns, okay, they would actually try to intubate them before the swelling occurs, because once the swelling occurs, it'd be very difficult to get anything down into their airway. And then what we'll see as somebody brings less oxygen in is obviously that their mental status has to start heading south. But the, when somebody first feels like they can't breathe, actually what happens is they, they get very nervous, right? I mean, if, you, if somebody was preventing you from taking a deep breath, you would get very, very nervous. So if you see the mental status decreasing, that means it's later into their breathing problems. So now let's talk about some sounds that we would hear if things are not exactly as they should be, okay? So the most common upper airway abnormal sound that we typically hear is snoring, right? And sometimes it's emergency and it's sometimes it's just because we're a little overweight and deep, deeply asleep, okay? And sometimes can even have, you know, people could have, uh, you know, mild sleep apnea and not be overweight. They just happen to be, you know, the way their body is designed. It's just very common for their tongue to partially obstruct their airway. So the snoring that you've all heard other people do okay, is the same snoring that somebody has when they're unconscious and their airway is partially blocking, okay, their, uh, I'm sorry, their tongue is partially blocking their airway, okay. They also believe now that the larynx plays a role, okay, in that snoring sound too, okay. We don't have, on a BLS level, we don't have a device to hold the epiglottis out of the way, but we do have a device to hold the tongue up out of the way, okay. Now, gurgling is this, how they classify the sound of fluid in the upper airway, Okay, so that could be blood, that could be vomitous. If it was a drowning, that could be water. And we do have a device, a suction, a vacuum type of machine to remove that, okay? And then strider is the, the sound that when the, tr when the larynx, the top of the trachea, right? Let me go back up, I keep on losing the slide. The larynx, this structure up here, we said is the gateway, right? It only lets air through here. Okay, your epiglottis is supposed to prevent anything but air from going in here. But let's say you're talking and swallowing, okay? So remember, to talk, the epiglottis has to be in the up position to let air through here because this is where your vocal cords are, your voice box. So if you're talking and swallowing like you're having a good meal and maybe some alcohol is involved or something like that, it's possible to trick all these safety mechanisms. And now something enters in here or you breathe in something. You've all, you know... Uh, you've got some dust or got something in your airway and you started coughing. A cough is a protective mechanism to get it out, okay? But the larynx has the ability to spasm or shut, okay? And or narrow, right? And when that happens, the sound that somebody makes is called strider, okay? So sometimes they abbreviate it as a crowing sound, like the bird crowing, I guess, makes a similar sound or it becomes somebody very becomes hoarse. You'll see sometimes when I'm teaching, I have to stop and take a drink, okay? And my voice gets and changes a little bit. So that would be like a hoarseness type of thing because I'm drying out my airway by talking so much. Now, strider typically is an inspiratory sound. So it's like a, a very prolonged inspiratory sound. You can't miss it. Okay. And it's caused by something called the laryngospasm. So laryngo is the larynx, the top is of the like trachea. Is it like a what? Like a whistle sound? No, that's actually a sound, but it's good you said it. That's the sound called asthma. So those of you who have kids who have bronchiolitis, asthma, RSV, you know, any of those types of problems, you hear more of a whistling sound. That's a lower airway sound. Right now we're talking about upper airway sounds. You can't miss Strider. It's so loud, you know, you'll know something is going on. So probably most of us have not had kids who've had Strider. You know, sometimes if kids get a lot of croup, 
uh, which is an upper airway problem in kids, you can hear a little bit of strider. Mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of times with croup, it's more of a barking, like a uh, uh, type of cough. They make that kind of sound. Okay. Okay. So now in the lower airway sound, the bronchioles, right? Because before we were talking more to up towards the top. So the top is going to be your tongue, your larynx, and the secretions that could build up in your oropharynx. Now we're talking lower airway, which is the bronchioles. So when they say bronco, bronco right? Bronco is bronchioles. Okay. And constriction means making something tight, right? So, and the opposite of constriction is dilation. So here we have bronchoconstriction. It's a problem with the lower airways. And again, asthma is the classic one. You could have an anaphylaxis or an allergic reaction. Uh, in the wintertime, you could hear kids with re respiratory syncytial virus or RSV, right? So, or bronchiolitis, which is an infection in the lower airways. So all of those can cause the lower airways to narrow. And if you were to put your fingers to your mouth and blow air through it, you would make a whistling sound. The same thing when your lower airways are narrowed and air is traveling through it, it makes that same kind of whistling sound, okay, except it's inside the body, so you don't hear it as well, and that's called wheezing, all right? So I'll show you, I'll, you know, give you an example of that in a second, okay? So, but that's a lower airway problem, okay? Okay, so when we're talking about patient assessment, which is one of the next things we're going to go into, right? So I, I think it's uh, Thursday, we have our next class. We're going to talk about vital signs, which is the start of patient assessment. And we're going to go talk about how do we assess a patient. So assessing a patient means examining and trying to figure out what is wrong with the patient or playing like medical, medical detective, right? Trying to determine what is wrong with a patient. So airway obviously is one of the first things, okay, um, that we always assess, right? I talked to you the night, it was A, B, C, D, E, airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposed. Disability is how they talk about neurological or brain problems, okay? So we'll go through all those steps. Somebody asked, is bronchitis the same as bronchiolitis? Uh, bronchitis is the upper part of the airway, right? So if we were looking over here, bronchitis would be the bigger tubes, bronchiolitis is the smaller tubes, okay? So similar, um, yes, but not exactly the same, okay? And kids tend to get more bronchiolitis than adults do. I don't know why, but I could look it up if I remember. Okay, so we're doing airway assessment. The questions we ask is, is the patient's airway open? Now, how do we know a patient's airway is open? Well, if they're awake, they can talk to us, okay? Or, you know, there's nothing indicating that there's a problem with getting air in and out. And that term in medicine for saying is a patient's airway open is patent, right? I talked about that one night. I said, does the patient have a patent airway, okay? So patent airway means it's a good airway, air is getting through it, there's no problems. So the first thing, is the airway open? If it is, will it stay open? Is anything going to endanger? Does anything going to cause the patient to shut down their airway? So now obviously, in a conscious patient who's talking to you, the answer is the airway is open, it's probably going to stay open, and there's probably nothing that's going to endanger it because the patient's wide awake and talking to me. Now, if you have an unconscious patient, you know, patient, I don't know, is drunk or on drugs and they're unconscious, they're laying there. Well, there's a lot of things that could go wrong, right? Their tongue could partially obstruct their airway. They could vomit and aspirate. They could, you know, who knows what could happen, right? So there's just so many things that could go wrong. So airway is always how we kind of start our assessment. And we remember, we said that when we're doing that initial or primary assessment, the purpose of it is, is always a test question. It says, what is the purpose of the initial assessment or primary assessment? It's to, to detect, which it means to find, to detect and treat life-threatening problems in the order that you find them. So since airway starts, we fix everything that's wrong with the airway before we go on to breathing. So if somebody had a totally unmanageable airway, either blood pouring out, you're suctioning, you can't stop it, you may never get to get to breathing because you're only managing the airway problem. Now, on a test, it's always airway, breathing, circulation, disability. I'll just tell you one thing in real life. If you get to somebody who's breathing poorly or even somebody who's not breathing at all, and at the same time, they have an arterial bleed and blood is spurting out, okay? So if you followed the book, it's airway, then it's breathing, then it's circulation, right? So you wouldn't deal with the breathing till two steps down and you'd be stuck in the airway section. But this is where you have to you know, multitask. So if you have somebody who's got severe bleeding, you're either going to have to assign somebody, and it could be a bystander, it could be a family member, to get some pressure on that bleeding. And we, you know, we didn't really cover breathing, bleeding control in the, any great depth, but you're going to have to get some. And that may just be a tourniquet. If you're by yourself, you may just have to throw a tourniquet on that patient's arm and shut that bleeding off, okay, so that you can go back and man manage the airway. Because 
if you don't have any blood in your body because you're bled to death, is having good oxygen coming into your body of any use? No, because the oxygen has to get into the bloodstream to get to the cells. So even though on the, you know, on the book and on the test, it's airway, breathing, circulation, you know, if you, if you get out of order, you get the question wrong. In real life, okay, you know, you got to use common sense. If somebody's got blood spurting out, you got to stop the bleeding. At the same time, you may be managing the airway and you probably, you know, you may not be doing a good job with the airway until you get the bleeding under control. And that would be a situation where you wouldn't even bother going to hemostatic gauze or anything for bleeding control, you go right to a tourniquet because you got to stop it so you can move on to more important things. Okay. So how do we know the airway is open? So again, most of the patients we deal with are conscious. So as long as they're talking to us, we know they have an open airway, right? We know that they have a patent airway. Okay. Now, when do people have a problem? So if they can't speak, they can't speak in full sentences. Okay. Their voice sounds weird or their family saying their voice sounds weird or something like that. Okay, a raspy is like the same thing that happens when, you know, you'll see halfway through class, my voice changes a little bit and it gets, you know, it gets a little harder for me to talk. So you notice a change in it, okay? So we said the upper airway sounds, again, snoring is the most common one, and that's when the tongue and epiglottis relax, okay? Gurgling are fluids, okay? So something's, something liquidy is in the airway, and again, we have suction for that. And then strider is a problem with the, uh, the larynx or the top of the trachea. And we said that could happen in an allergic reaction, a severe allergic reaction, which is called anaphylaxis. And people who suffer burns to their airway, okay? People who have something lodged in the upper part of their airway, whether it be a foreign body or who knows, piece of food, okay? It could be from blunt trauma, like somebody was punched in the neck or banged their neck on something, or some of the different diseases, croup and epiglottitis, that people can get, okay? And we're going to cover all these individually, you know, as we go through class and not necessarily all tonight, but as we go through class. Okay. So just remember, just because you assess the airway at the beginning of the primary assessment doesn't mean that something cannot change throughout the call. So you're always kind of paying attention, right? So it's not like you, once you say it was good and it's patent that you can forget about it because it could change at any moment. I worked last night and I had a patient who, you know, said prior, prior to me getting there that, that she, they, the family said she had a seizure, okay? And, you know, she was in that sleep-like stage after the seizure, but as the minutes go by, she's starting to wake up and talk a little bit, okay? But then she had another seizure, and when she had that second seizure, she bit her tongue, so now there was blood, right? So this was a patient who really, other than starting the IV on her to give her medicine to stop her seizure, most of the time that I spent treating her and when the ambulance came, the EMTs that helped me was suctioning her airway, trying to keep her airway open, because every time she had a seizure, her pulse ox dropped from 96, 97, which is, you know, somewhat normal, down to the 80s, and she turned blue, you know, because she got cyanotic, because she wasn't getting any air in. So really, we had nothing else to do for her. I never put her on EKG. I never got a blood pressure. I never was able to get anything else on her, because we were so busy trying to manage her airway, okay? And that's, that can happen, you know? You always, again, you treat the life-threatening problems in the order that you find them. Okay, so what when they say inadequate breathing, right? Adequate would be good breathing. Inadequate breathing would be, you know, breathing that is not good. So obviously if had no, somebody's not breathing or if it looks like they're trying to breathe, but you don't see any air coming in and out of their body, right? They have an obstruction and they can't get any air out, okay? Something that tells you there's a foreign body in their airway. Somebody tells you they were, you know, the person was eating and all of a sudden couldn't talk anymore, okay? You don't feel any air coming in out of their mouth if they were supine on the ground. They can't speak or it's hard for them to speak or their speech is not normal, right? It's very hoarse. It's very, um, um, you know, um, I don't know what another way of saying hoarse and raspy would be that would be more understandable, like uh, that type of, you know, talking. Um, that would be another indication that somebody's having problems. Okay. Um, let me skip this up then. Where'd I go here? Hmm. Oh, that's weird. I'm getting dizzy. Okay, 
so what else are signs of inadequate breathing? So when you see somebody using muscles other than their diaphragm or intercostals uh, to breathe, they, so they call those accessory muscles, extra muscles. Okay, so they see their stomach, their neck, these muscles tugging when they're trying to breathe, that when you learn how to listen to breath sounds or lung sounds, that they're very quiet or absent completely, or do you hear any of the abnormal sounds? So wheezing, again, we said is lower airway, crowing, strider, okay, are the same, right? A raspy, all the same, that's all the larynx, snoring is the tongue, gurgling is fluids in the upper airway, okay, gasping, <laughs> like I can't breathe, you know, I can't get any air in. In small children and infants, sometimes you'll see their nose starting to like flop and flail as they're breathing and stuff like that. And in kids, again, you know, you see them, they're pulling on their muscles up here, your clavicles or your collarbone, right? The bones that go across over here. So you see all this pulling in here because they're trying to use extra muscles to breathe. Now, how do we open the airway? Okay. So if somebody's unconscious, you already learned the head tilt chin lift and you learned the modified jaw thrust. Okay. Now we're going to add to the head tilt chin lift that we have devices that can help us, okay, keep those, keep those airways open. So like that lady last night that I was talking about, you know, we had one of the, the people on the ambulance was keeping her jaw up, you know, she was clenched, so it was very hard, but it was keeping, trying to keep their jaw up to help keep their tongue because she was snoring away, this lady, to keep her tongue open, and we couldn't get her mouth open because she was clenched, her teeth were tight together because of the seizure and stuff like that. Okay, so if the airway is not open, we have to open it, okay? We always have to think of the possibility of having any kind of injury to the neck, so if the injury is to the neck, we have to try to use that jaw thrust procedure. But if we can't get the airway open and we can't ventilate the patient, we are allowed to go back to the modified jaw thrust. Again, we talked about that the other night, that you know, airway usually takes precedence over a possibility of a spinal cord injury because most of the times people do not have spinal cord injury. So if somebody has no airway, they're not breathing, and you can't get any air into them using the jaw thrust technique, and I'll show you that in a second, that you are allowed to do the modified jaw thrust, I'm, I'm sorry, the head tilt chin lift to get air in and stuff like that, okay? So the, the two main procedures again, head tilt chin lift like you did in CPR, and some of you said that they had practice to jaw thrust on the CPR mannequin, it doesn't really work. And again, on people, to be honest with you, it doesn't really work well. We try it just in case this one particular person, air does go in using it, but if air doesn't go in and we need to ventilate the patient, we still have to revert back to the head tilt chin lift. So the head tilt chin lift, okay, is basically where we're kind of tilting the head back to keep it into position, okay? Um, sometimes it's a little hard to move the, the head in this position and stuff, but you may have to reach under the neck just to tilt it a little bit. Never answer that on a test. They don't like to see you putting your hands on people's necks and stuff, but sometimes in real life, especially people when you see they have huge heads, it, you may have to do that to get the head to tilt back. So when you're doing this, what you're doing, really the reason you're doing it is you're making the mandible or the lower jaw go straight up. And again, since the tongue is attached to the lower jaw, the higher you could raise the lower jaw, the more you're going to pull the tongue out of the back or the posterior of the oropharynx, right? Because it's it's because he's flat now, his tongue is trying to go which way? His tongue is trying to go this way. So that's posterior, okay, of his oropharynx, and that's where we get that snoring sound. Okay, so again, you know, you practice this and stuff like that, but you typically one hand on the forehead, one hand on the mandible, and you tilt the head, lift the chin at the same time, okay? Um, we don't want to pull too far back, especially in, in children and infants and stuff like that. Uh, most of the times in children, they put them in what's called the sniffing position. So when you sniff, right, you, you just tilt your head a tiny little bit. You're not pulling it all the way back, but just think when you sniff, right, you always raise your head just a tiny little bit. And infants nowadays, they're recommending actually no head tilt, chin lift, but just to keep their head in a neutral position. Now, kids body-wide, right, their, their body size is not in proportion yet. In other words, You've seen kids who look like their head is really big or, you know, their arms are really long. They don't match the size of their body and stuff. So in some kids, you know, certain parts of their body grow quicker than others. So you could have this situation where their head is growing bigger than the rest of their body. And what's going to happen is the back of the head, which is called the, ox the occiput, it could be very rounded or pronounced. And when you lay them flat, it makes their head come like this. And if that's the case, you have to build up underneath their shoulders, and I'll show you a second, to keep their head in a neutral position. So again, this would be an exaggeration on an infant because nowadays we don't do that much, but they would go in a kind of a neutral position, right? So now that's probably a little better, um, you know, kind of a neutral straight line where 
you know, their, their head and neck is in a kind of a straight line. So we don't really want to flex them too much. This is, again, what happens sometimes when kids, okay, have a, like the back of their head is very pronounced, they flex forward. So what you need to do is build up under their shoulders to raise it to the same height as their head, and then everything will go into like a normal position, okay? So whatever you have to kind of build up underneath them, that's what you would do. And it it's only depends if that's, if you see this, then you have to do this, okay? If you don't see this, you don't have to do this. Now, what's interesting too, like in these pictures is we can see, right, the kid's ribs. So remember running under each one of these ribs is a muscle that's gonna help him with breathing. And then there's also intercostal muscles. So they're between each ribs. All intercostal means is between the ribs. So there's intercostals here and over this way. And then it's hard to make it out, but coming up along here and down along here, because this is his rib cage, right? This is his sternum, right? And then you have a little xiphoid process right over here. So running under this, because on kids you could see it, this kind of V shape, right? Letter V shape, that would be his diaphragm. So you see on this kid, because he's so thin, how it's easy to see, you know, his respiratory muscles and, you know, muscles he would use to breathe and stuff like that. Okay. Now, if we cannot do the head tilt chin lift because we suspect a spinal cord injury, okay, then we have to do the modified jaw thrust. So what is the modified jaw thrust? Is that, again, you're going to reach with these fingers on both sides for the angle of the mandible, right? So the mandible comes down and then angles up a little bit and you have your fingers and you could feel it on yourself, right? You have your angle of your mandible here. And what you're going to do is you're going to push upward. You can't do this in a conscious patient. This is only works on an unconscious patient because their muscles are not tight, right? So we're gonna push upwards towards the ceiling or towards the clouds, towards the sky. And the concept again is that as you displace the jaw or the mandible this way, the tongue should come with it and you should open up the airway. Now the problem is gonna be if you have to ventilate that patient, you know, it becomes a little difficult to hold the mask at the, up, you know, to press the mask on his face at the same time that you're holding the jaw up, but we'll practice with that in class. Okay, as a jaw thrust in an infant, it's much harder, right? Because infants' heads sit right on their shoulders. They don't really have much of a neck. So it's a very difficult procedure. But again, for an infant to have a spinal cord injury, it'd be pretty rare. Um, it would have to be like they fell, you know, they fell off, uh, you know, the, out of the parent's arms or they were not restrained properly in a car seat or not restrained at all in a car seat that was involved in an accident or something like that. Okay, so again, we use it to try to, as best we can, open up the patient's airway you know, we'll practice it. Don't worry about the steps and stuff like that because, or written steps, because it's better to just practice it. Now we know if the patient's unconscious, we have to put them in what they call the recovery position, which means that we put them on their side and that's to prevent them from aspirating or getting something into their airway. If they're on their side, the feeling is that whatever it is, blood, water, vomitus will flow outwards and stuff like that. We do not do that in somebody who suspects a spinal cord injury or anything like that. And we cannot do that if we need to ventilate them, right? To be able to ventilate somebody, they have to be flat on their back. And again, if somebody has a spinal cord injury, we want to keep them flat on the back to try to protect their spine as best we can. And we'll practice that in class. Now, recovery position on the test does not matter if it's left or right. They're not going to ask you. Years ago, they kind of stressed putting the patient on the left side without really having a good reason to have them on their left side. Um, but, um, you know, I would say that it, on the test, I've never seen them specify. If they say it'll say right or left side, they won't say one or the other. Okay, so as long as they're on the side, that would be the recovery position, okay? And a lot of times here they have a pillow underneath the patient's head, but a lot of times in the pictures, you'll see that the lower arm, they kind of fold back like this and put it, put the patient's head on it, you know, and do the same thing so that you're keeping the spine, right? And the head in a, in a position, because remember you got the shoulder here. So you're building up underneath the patient to keep everything in a straight line. So you're not, you know, compromising or kinking the airway. Okay, so again, after the way airway is open, you have to continually keep it open, okay? So your head, tail, chin lift, or your modified jaw thrust. And now we have devices, okay, that we're gonna go over in a second that help you keep those airway open. So if there's secretions, okay, we have suction. If there's other obstructions, we can do our, modif uh, our Heimlich maneuver or our chest thrusts that we do, you know, when somebody's uh, supine on the ground. Now the term airway adjuncts, okay? An adjunct is something that helps. What, what is secretions? A fluid. Secretions could be vomit, could be blood, okay, um, water. You know, it could be something. It's it's a liquid that's in the airway, that's kind of caused. Secretions is a liquid. 
I'm sorry? Secretions is a liquid? It's not a type of liquid. It's a catch-all phrase for liquid. Any kind of liquid would be secretions. Any, any kind of fluid. Any kind of fluid. Yes, yeah. very good. Very good. So please, if anybody has an English word they do not understand, please ask it because if one person has the guts to ask it, I'm sure 50, 90% of the class also does not understand it and you're just not asking it. Okay, or you just send it as a chat, you know, if you don't wanna, if you don't want to uh, call it out loud, okay? Yes, secretions is just a general term, a catch-all term for any type of fluid in the airway. Okay, so airway adjuncts are devices to help us keep the airway open. The first way we work on keeping the airway open is either the head, tail, chin lift or modified jaw thrust. And then in addition to what we put in these devices. But just because you put the device in does not mean that you do not still hold the airway open with either your modified jaw thrust or your um, head, tail, chin lift, depending on the situation, okay? So it says here, used in conjunction with manual airway maneuvers. So the manual airway maneuvers are the head, tail, chin lift or the modified jaw thrust, okay? And you then you could use these adjuncts to help you. So we have one called the oropharyngeal airway and we have one called the nasopharyngeal airway. Again, they're gonna abbreviate it O-P-A, which is easier for people to say than oropharyngeal airway, or N-P-A, the first letter of nasal, the first letter of pharyngeal, and the first letter of airway, right? That's how they, they would abbreviate it. So most of the times you're gonna hear people say an O-P-A or N-P-A, they're not gonna say, um, or an oral airway or a nasal airway. You know, they're not going to put the pharyngeal in because that's a little harder for people to uh, people to pronounce. Okay. But the big thing here, on, you know, and especially on the test, is that this doesn't take the place of the head, tail, chin lift or the modified jaw thrust. You still have to use one of those two and then add this to it, okay, to help you keep the airway open. Okay, so again, everything we're doing here, Okay, um, you know, positioning and maneuvers, that's short term, the adjuncts provide a better longer term. Okay, and we said OPA or NPA are the way we abbreviate them. Now, if I were to take, and you'll see in a second what they look like, if I was to take a hard white piece of plastic and put it in your mouth, you would gag or choke. So an oral airway can only go in someone who has no, what they call gag reflex. Your gag reflex, you see over here is a protective mechanism to stop something from causing you to have to choke right so when they say exhibiting they're saying not showing a gag reflex so you've all gagged and the most classic thing i would say now is you know a strep test the doctor takes the q-tip goes all the way to the back of your throat and you're like uh, 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 because there's special nerves in the back of your throat okay that if it senses something coming back there that it doesn't want it makes you gag to kind of shoot it out of your airway so you don't get it you know into your lungs okay Again, we have to first open the airway manually, which is the head, tail, chin lift or modified jaw thrust before we use an adjunct, okay? And then, you know, you'll see these devices. The important thing is to see what you're doing, not to blindly put them in a patient's mouth because you could be kind of pushing down on the tongue and blocking the airway further if you're not watching what you're doing, but I'll show you how to do that. Anytime you're gonna do an airway procedure, you wanna have suction available in case the person vomits while you're doing it. Okay, and if the patient starts gagging while you're inserting the airway, you actually just remove it, right? You don't force it in because it could just make them vomit and stuff like that. And then you have to, again, keep the head, right, in the right position, whether it be head tilt or modified jaw thrust and continue to monitor airway, okay? Again, if you need suction, if there's secretions, fluids, bloods, or anything in the airway, okay? And if you originally put the airway in because the patient was unconscious, and they become more conscious now, maybe because you're helping them get more oxygen in, and now they feel it because they're waking up and they start to gag, you remove it. And I'll show you how to do that in a second. And anytime you're doing any airway procedures, you have to have, in addition to gloves, okay, you have to have on um, a mask, okay? And we know with COVID now, it has to be an N95 mask and eye protection. So goggles or a face shield. And I would recommend having a gown, like something over your clothing, because if somebody's coughing or spitting or anything like that, and you get it all over your clothing, you know, now you have to launder that clothing in your washing machine. And I would probably, if you are going to do, have to take it home and launder it, I would do it separately of all the other clothing and stuff like that. Okay, so the first device we're going to talk about is an oropharyngeal airway, and we're going to show you in a second. It's a curved either white or green, actually some of them are multicolor now, so I guess I can't say that anymore, but they're a hard white piece of plastic, okay, with the curve of the throat built into them, 
that kind of slips under the tongue and holds the tongue up in place. They have sizes from a little tiny baby all the way to a large adult. So this was the, the classic set that everybody always bought. Okay, that's probably the most common thing in white. These channels along the side are to slide a flexible suction catheter down. You'll see it looks like a tube that can go down here and suction the airway lower. And I'm gonna show you in a second how to size them. But picture, this is a hard white piece of plastic. So for you, you could not put that in your mouth right now because you would gag. So for a patient to be able to accept this, they have to be deeply unconscious. So it accomplishes two things, actually. It accomplishes helping to keep the tongue up out of the way, in addition to either the head tilt, chin lift, or the modified jaw thrust. And also is a little bit of an assessment tool because if you have somebody, you don't know how deeply unconscious they are, and you stick this in their mouth and they don't gag, you know they're deeply unconscious. If you stick it in their mouth and they start gagging, they start waking up, you know, you used it kind of almost as a painful stimuli, right, to like a sternal rub to, uh, to wake a patient up. So it has a, you know, dual purpose. So they're showing you how to size it, okay? So there's two ways that people, this is the way I size it, um, the way it kind of sits in the patient's mouth. Now, don't take this like super literally, but really it would be from the, it's just a rough estimate from the center of the mouth, right? Cause that's how it's gonna sit to the angle of the jaw. And I know the way we're looking here, some people are gonna say, well, it's protruding a little bit past the angle of the jaw. Don't worry about it. So center of the mouth to the angle of the jaw or the corner of the mouth to the earlobe. And I'll show you, I think I have a picture of the other way too. Yes. So here's the other way, right? So one was going this way, which is what I like because that's how it actually sits, right? This is how it sits in the patient's airway. So this, this is the way I like to measure it, okay? Doesn't matter, you could do it either way. And then this is the other way, but this is never how it's gonna sit in the airway because the airway is going this way, right? So those are the two ways. So you just corner the mouth to the ear, okay? Or the center of the mouth to the angle of the jaw, okay? And it's not precise. Oh, so somebody wrote the second option works better for people with beards, okay? Could be, right? Okay, so what do we do? The patient has to be supine or on their back, okay? And we have to open their airway. So the, on the test, they're gonna tell you to open their airway, what they call the cross finger technique. Let me see if I have a picture. So this is the cross finger technique. I've never once in my life ever done this. So basically what you're doing is you're putting your fingers and going like this, right? You're crossing your fingers over each other. So you're grabbing your teeth and going like this and opening their airway, totally useless. So how do you open their airway? You go like this, right? You just one hand here, one hand here you open their airway, it's never a problem. Unless like last night where that patient was clenched, there was no way to open that airway. But on the test, when they ask you, how do you open a patient's mouth? Okay, it's a cross finger technique. Now, here's where the terminology screws people up. The test question could say to you, how do you open a patient's airway? That would be a modified jaw thrust or head tilt chin lift. Or it could say, how do you open a patient's mouth? So for some of you, you're gonna say a mouth and an airway are the same thing but the mouth is the mouth, the airway is the whole thing, right? So they're saying, how do you open the path to get air in? Head tilt, chin lift, modified jaw thrust, OPA, NPA. How do you open the mouth? Cross finger technique, right? So two separate things. Okay. Um, now, when we insert it, now this again may be a little like weird. You would think, right, it's gonna have to go this way because that's how it's gonna sit. But what we do is we actually insert it backwards up until about this part is into the mouth so that the tip of it is pointing this way and gets behind the tongue and then we turn it 180 degrees, right? So in other words, we put it in till it gets about halfway and we turn it and we're actually catching, going past the tongue and catching it and lifting it up out of the way. And it'll make more sense when, you know, you practice on the mannequins and stuff like that, okay? So again, you insert it along the roof of the mouth. So the roof of the mouth is right? Like basically going here. So halfway to about halfway on the curve. And then you're going to turn it 180 degrees, right? So you're turning it half the way it is. So now it's going to be where this is going to swing around. And this curve part is going to go like this under their tongue. Okay. Okay. So some people are saying that you already did them. So I guess you practice that and you know how to do it. Okay. And, um, Usually what'll happen is that, you know, if you have it in the right position, okay, the flange or this, this part, uh, so this would be the flange, the part that actually sits on their lips, 
okay? That would sit on her lips. Now, you may have measured and think you have the right size and you can't get it in. So it's too large for them. So then you would just go one, one size um, down and stuff like that. Okay, again, sizing, okay? Putting it in backwards and then turning it so that it sits there, okay? If they start to um, gag or anything like that, when you pull it out, you just pull it straight out. You don't turn it back 180 degrees. So if they were to gag, right, and this is sitting, so it's curving this way, you just actually pull it straight out, okay, if they start to gag. Okay, again, if they gag, you have to pull it out, and you basically pull it out in the position it's sitting in the patient's mouth. You don't have to turn it back 180 degrees, because obviously it would just make them uh, gag more. And this is how it's gonna sit. This is the tongue, right, here. And what it's doing is it's acting almost like a splint to keep, help keep the tongue up out of the way, right? Here's your epiglottis. Here's your opening to your trachea. This is your larynx, right? There's your, your um, thyroid cartilage. And this is your esophagus. And remember, when you swallow, this rises towards this and this drops towards this. And this basically closes over the opening so that the food or water that you're swallowing goes into your esophagus, okay? Uh, in children and infants, uh, and again, I've only probably less than a dozen times inserted an oral airway or a nasal airway in a kid, right? It's just we, kids don't get sick, so we don't usually do it. But there you have to use some type of device to reach down and hold the tongue up out of the way, and then you insert it straight in. The only reason you're doing it is they feel the skin on the roof of your mouth in a, as a child is, is fragile or is easily damaged. And if you're turning that hard white piece of plastic, you can somehow you know, injure it more. And the other thing is that the kids are very susceptible when you stick things in their mouth to slow down their airway. They have that vasovagal. So if you're rubbing that airway on the roof of their mouth, you can cause that vasovagal reaction that we've said was a form of um, distributive shock where their heart slows down and their blood vessels dilate and they don't get enough blood to their brain and then they faint. So kids are very susceptible to doing that, okay? So again, you know, I know you said you did it. I just don't know how much they practice with you and stuff like that. And I'm not sure if they took, you know, again, most of the mannequins that we have to practice on are always adult mannequins. So, you know, they may not have been much in time for practicing. But here they're showing, right, using some type of tongue depressor or something to hold the tongue. And then you would just put it in like this. You wouldn't put it in backwards and then rotate it. You would just actually slide it in in the direction that it goes, okay? Now, a nasopharyngeal airway. So nasopharyngeal airways are soft plastic. These are not hard. These are very flexible, soft plastic airways, okay? Uh, and again, in multiple sizes, okay? And they don't really hold the tongue up out of the way because they're so soft. What they basically do is provide a path for air to get past the tongue. So the tongue may have slid back, but this slides under the tongue and you have a way of getting a little bit of air back there. Now they're not as good as an oral airway, but if somebody's gagging, right, when you're trying to put an oral airway in, you can't do it. So this would be your next best device to be able to put it in, okay? So it's basically, see here it says, providing a channel for air. So it's just a way for some air to get past it. Okay. Now we do two different types of sizing when we're, two different ways of sizing when we do a nasal airway. So we'll talk about in a second. Now, when do we use it? When do we not use it? So we can use it on people who are not deeply unconscious, but still have snoring respirations, like that lady last night that was in the sleep-like stage after a seizure at a postictal uh, um, stage. Maybe somebody's drunk. Maybe somebody you know, took some drugs. If you try to put that hard white piece of plastic in their mouth, they're going to gag, but you may be able to slide this in their nose. Now, obviously, we're using a lubricant so that it's not painful while you're sliding in their nose and everything like that. And then on the test, they're going to ask you, when can you not use a nasal airway? So on an uh, uh, oral airway, we cannot use it if somebody's had damage to their teeth, where we may displace the teeth down into the airway, or somebody's not deeply unconscious and they still have a gag reflex. On the nasopharyngeal airway, the, the time you cannot use it or contraindication. So an indication is a reason to do something, right? So indication, reason to do something. Contra means, you know, you don't do it. So, uh, so an indication would be we stick the airway in because they have snoring respirations. A contraindication would be somebody who has signs of head trauma. And it's a specific type of skull fracture 
called the basilar skull. So basilar sounds like base and the base is the bottom. So it's actually the bottom part of the skull, especially if it's fractured right behind the nose. And obviously the concern is as you stick the airway in their nose, if they have a large enough fracture that the airway can enter into their, come up and enter into their cranial cavity, into their brain, okay? So how do we, how do we see it? So we have early signs and late signs. So the early sign is that you would see fluid leaking from their ears or nose, and that fluid could be what they call cerebral spinal fluid, which is the protective fluid that bathes the brain in the spinal cord. It's a yellowish fluid, okay, like a light yellowish fluid or blood. So if you see blood coming from the nose or the ears after somebody's had trauma to their head, you would suspect a basal skull fracture. If you found somebody unconscious laying there and you, you know, they've been down for a long period of time, they may develop bruising, okay, and the orbits of the eyes are the socket, right, that the eye sits in. So it looks like they have a black eye, okay? Or the mastoid bone is a bone right behind your ear. You could feel it if you feel kind of behind your ear. They could develop bruising over there. But those are late signs because to develop a bruise takes hours, right? So if you found somebody unconscious with bruising over there, okay, um, it would be a, a late sign. They've been laying there for a while. So let's see. Uh, Let's see. Somebody wrote, what if the tongue is already quite deep with children? How do you get it upwards? So in other words, what if the tongue flop backwards is what you're saying? You know, how can you get it forward? Okay. And can't use tongue depressor for adult. It's not that you can't use it. It takes longer to do it with a tongue depressor. So in adults, we just usually put it in backwards and then screw it and grab the tongue. Okay. So the first question is, if the tongue is relaxed backwards, um, you really just have to, you know, I probably have to get somebody to shine a light from your phone or from a flashlight. One person shines a light down there. The other person has to use the tongue depressor to kind of hold it up. Now you can't grab anybody's tongue with your gloves. It'll just slip right off, but you can grab it if you have your gloves on and use a gauze pad, the white, you know, pads we use for whatever cleaning up or blood or anything. You can grab a tongue with the gauze pad to be able to lift it up out of the way. So you may have to use the tongue depressor a little bit. Okay to help you, but then you're going to wind up having to grab it probably to get it out. So again, we're talking about when we would not use a nasopharyngeal airway. We said basal or skull fracture. Usually in the test, they say somebody who has a head injury or skull fracture. They don't usually specify which one. And the early sign would be blood or cerebral spinal fluid from the nose or ears or both. And the late sign would be bruising around the eyes. That's the orbits of the eyes. Okay. Or the mastoid bone behind the ear. Again, it could be both. Okay. Question, the, the behind the ear, that's when you have a brain hemorrhage or, right? It's when you have a fracture to the bone. So this is what I'm showing you here. This is your basal or skull. So right, here's your, here's your entire skull, right? Your basal or skull is the bottom part of here because remember, this is where your brain is. So this is basically stopping your brain from falling, you know, the rest of the way down, okay? Now at the base of the basal or skull, we said that there's a hole and that's where your spinal cord comes up into your brain, right? So your brain is sitting on this platform here and that hole, that big hole in the base of the skull the is spine. where, is where the spinal cord, okay, the nerve comes up. The, the, so that base of that skull that you're looking at right now rests on your spinal column on the bone. So your head is resting on the first cervical vertebrae, okay, well it's, and the first cervical vertebrae has the ability to spin a little bit and that's how you're able to turn, turn your head. Okay, so somebody has a fracture of the basal or skull, okay, that's what you would see there. And again, this is towards the front of your head, right? Let me just actually look. Yeah, this is towards the front, right? So if it fractures here and your nose is right in front of it, if you stick something up the nose, there's a theory, like, so we're looking like this, right? So you stick something up their nose, there's a theoretical you know, problem that it could go up into the, into the skull, into the brain cavity. Okay. So that's why you don't want to do that. Okay. So again, that's always a test question. So this is what cerebral spinal fluid looks like. Okay. It can be this like clearish, like yellowish fluid. Okay. Dripping out right out of their nose. Um, again, most of the times it's hard to see it. It may be night, right? So it's a little more difficult to be able to actually see it. Sometimes it's actually in the ear canal. So just like the doctor, 
you know, has the, the otoscope that they could look into your ear, it would be the same thing. It'd be hard for us to see it because we don't carry that, that otoscope to look in people's ears and stuff like that. And then this would be when you looked in your ear, if you saw the bruising, so that's actually using the otoscope and looking in your ear. But this is the battle signs that you'd see behind the ears, right? So that's how you'd see the bruising over there. And this is the bruising around the eyes, the orbits of the eyes. But these are very late signs, right? Because for a bruise to develop, it's going to take hours or sometimes even a day or two for a bruise to develop. So these are not early signs, okay? Now, nasal airways, okay, come in various different sizes. I'm going to show you in a second. And the sizes are length and also the diameter of the tubes. So as they get longer, they get fatter. And you want to put in the longest, fattest one you can because you're trying to move air through the airway. So you don't want to like a, a tiny little straw to try to get air into a patient. They classify it by numbers. So, you know, the adult sizes, again, are like 28 and above. And French is just a measurement um, for certain devices. So sometimes there's just, you know, you'll see like, you know, 24 French, 28 French. So it's just a name of a measurement, okay? Now, since it's going into the nose and you know people have nosebleeds and stuff like that, it has to be well lubricated, okay? And it's very important on the test. So when they say, what can you use to lubricate it? It has to be a water-based lubricant. So Vaseline is an oil-based lubricant. And the difference is a water-based lubricant can be broken down by the body and gotten rid of. A petroleum jelly will stay in their nose forever. So if you were to like just take Vaseline, coat it with Vaseline, stick it up in their nose, it will stay there forever until they sneeze enough and, and whatever, pick their nose enough to get it out where water-based just basically gets broken down by the body, okay, and, you know, it leaves. There's no, there's no problems. So we always, we don't use, ever use um, Vaseline for anything, you know, in medicine. Vaseline is something that can be applied on the external part of the body, okay, but it can't go internal to the body. Okay, so this is showing you sizing it. So you basically go from their nose to the angle of their jaw, some people say from their nose to their ear, either one is fine. Okay, so either nose to ear or nose to the angle of the jaw. Now the other measurement is, uh, two other ways you may see them talking about measuring it. They may say that you wanna look at the opening to their nose, okay, to get an idea of how wide a tube will fit, okay? Or some people will actually say, and I don't know if this has ever been studied, but to look at their pinky, their small finger, and that's about the diameter of their, their nose. So the pinky is around the same diameter of their nose. I don't know, again, if that's actually super accurate, but just on a test, you may see it being talked about being measured in different ways. Now you have to have some type of water-soluble lubricant on it, okay? So they come, that comes in the package, you know, that the nasal airway is packaged in and stuff like that. So you don't have to look for it or anything, it's in there, okay? And you would wanna lubricate it well, okay? Now, it always starts by going in the right nostril. The reason why is, remember I told you you had those shelves that make the air spin around called the turbinates? Well, if you look at the tip of the airway, you see it has what's called a bevel. It has a cut on an angle, and that bevel is designed so that it should slide over those shelves and not get, um, not get caught up on them, okay? Um, and again, I don't really think it ever really will because it's so soft and flexible, but that's how they designed it. So on the test, you would always answer that you would insert it in the right nostril, not the left, okay? Now, what they're doing now is as they're, as they're doing it, the only thing I would say is wrong with this picture is that I would hold it a little lower on the airway. Like I would be holding it down here because you have a little more control. When you hold it up here, if it's a little hard to get it into the nose, it's just going to start wiggling. But what they're showing you here is with your other hand, you want to take their nose and pull back on it. They call it a pig's nose because I guess a pig's nose is kind of raised up a little bit. So by doing that and pulling up on it, you're making the opening to the nostril as big as possible to be able to get it in. And what you really want to do is when it goes in, you may need to wiggle it a little bit, but it should be going this way, right? Because this is your nasopharynx right in here. It should not be going towards the skull. It should be going into the nasopharynx. And then it's gonna go behind the tongue and give a little pathway for air to get past it. Okay, so here you see them making the pig's nose. Okay, pulling back and inserting it. Okay. 
So again, push the tip of the nose upward. That's making the pig's nose. Keep the head in a neutral position. Advance it all the way down until the flange or the, the, um, the lowest piece of it is resting up against the nostril. Okay. Now suctioning. So we have machines that suction. They're battery operated. In the ambulance, they have ones that are electrically operated. And then we also have devices that are mechanically operated. By squeezing, we make suction. So suction is a way to remove the general term is secretion. So, question, please. Yes. Hmm? How do you do the and the nasal the nasal uh, pharyngeal? Do you also do the head and shoulder? Nope. Lift? Neutral neutral position. Neutral means only, only by the oral. Only by the oral you do that. Only so after you put it in, okay then you would do the head, the head tilt chin lift. So when you put it in, you usually put it in when they're flat in a neutral position, okay? And then you tilt their head after you put it in. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have to close the other hole from the nose when you put in the nasal airway? No. You were saying like, is air gonna come back out their nose? No, so you don't have to close off. You know, you put the, you're putting the nasal airway in the right nostril, you don't have to worry about the left nostril, okay? Okay, so again, remember, secretions is just a general term for water, blood, vomitus, anything that could be in the airway, okay? Um, some people, you know how you have saliva, you have the wet stuff in your mouth. Some people say secretions are saliva, but really secretions are a general term for fluids and stuff like that, okay? So we're using a basically a vacuum type. So in the ambulance, there's a, there's a, a mounted one on the wall that's, that's very strong. It's, it's um, electrically operated, okay? And... Um, it, you know, it's like a, a small vacuum built in there and stuff like that, okay? Now, on the test, they're going to ask you how much pressure, how much vacuum should a suction device be able to generate, okay? And the answer is 300 millimeters of mercury, right? So 300 mmHg is millimeters of mercury, okay? So they have to be able to generate at least, okay? So no less than at least 300 millimeters of mercury, and we'll, we'll see that again throughout the test we'll talk about that so remember that number okay portable suction that we could bring in the house is battery operated okay nowadays it's really only battery operated they used to years ago have ones that you could hook the oxygen to and when the oxygen ran through the device it created suction but people realized those devices would deplete your oxygen and then you wouldn't have any oxygen to give the patient so now they're most of them are you know lithium ion batteries that last you know forever and they work very well and stuff like that and then there's manual ones that we said that when we pull a handle or squeeze that generates some suction. Now, you also have to have some other devices. You have to have tubing, right, for, the, for to, you know, to bring the device to the patient's mouth. You have to have the, the, the part that actually goes into the uh, patient, okay? You have to have something that the vomitus is collected into that you could dispose, okay? And usually people like to have a little bottle of just water so that if the catheter, if the thing you're sticking in the patient's mouth gets clogged up with blood or whatever, you could stick it in the water to kind of free it up and stuff like that. So this is the wall mounted one, okay? Um, and sometimes they're green, sometimes they're white, okay? There's a gauge and you see the tubings coming off of it. And we, you know, we, we will have a night where we can go through all the different parts in the ambulance and stuff. This is the regulator that the oxygen comes out this plugs into something that looks like over here. So this piece actually comes out and plugs into here. So this is an empty oxygen port that you could plug a different device into, okay? Then there's battery operated ones, you know, um, same basic design or same basic concept, just a different design. So they're all gonna have a canister that the vomitus is gonna go into, a tube, okay? And then at the end of the tube is where you're gonna connect your suction catheter to put it into the patient. This is one of the more popular manual ones. So as you squeeze your hand together, you're generating suction. And this would be the part, obviously, that would go into the patient. This actual whole piece pops out when you're done and the vomitus comes in here and you just throw it away. Okay, now we have rigid suction catheters that we put in a patient's mouth. It's the main one that we really use. And then we have flexible ones. The uh, name of the rigid ones is called a Yankor. Okay, so just in case on the test, you know, they, they use that term, that's referring to the rigid ones. There's all different sizes, all different tips on them. Um, since we really use it in an emergency setting only for blood and fluid and secretions, you want one that has the largest opening so that you can get the most stuff out of the patient. Okay, so again, showing is going down. Now you're allowed to suction 
basically to the back of the oropharynx, right? You're not going to go past the back of the oropharynx. And when we practice, you know, I'll, I'll make sure they show you how to gauge how far you're going and stuff like that. Okay, so again, suction only as far as you can see. Okay, and you want to make sure that when you're sticking that in there, you're not causing them a gag or anything like that. Besides the rigid um, catheters, there's flexible ones. So, and they come in different sizes. They're also classified by French. So these could actually, you know, slide up somebody's nose, slide in their mouth. They're not really good for food and large amounts of blood. The rigid one is better, but these are better to get a little deeper into the body. And again, you size these the same way you size the nasal airway. So this would be deep enough to go into your lungs, but you're not allowed to suction down into the lungs. So you would, you would basically measure from the nose, okay, to the, to the angle of the jaw, okay? And that would give you a rough idea of how far you're allowed to insert it. So let's say this thing could, you know, reach your lungs, but you're only allowed to put it roughly to about here because that's the, you know, the deepest an EMT is permitted to suction, okay? So again, those are the flex, flexible suction catheter. So somebody's asking, what is this stuff used for? Again, this is if somebody has, right, we just saw blood, secretions, vomitus, fluid in their airway, and they're making that gurgling sound, and we have to get that out. So it's kind of like a vacuum to get those fluids out, okay? Um, Why should we suction through the nose versus the mouth? Uh, you know, it's pretty rare that we suction through the nose, but like last night, this lady was coughing up so much blood because she bit her tongue that some of the stuff started coming out her nose. So it was more important to suction out the mouth, but you know, once they did a good job of suctioning out the mouth, I said to them, switch from the rigid, the Yankor one, to the flexible one and just run it, you know, up and down their nose a couple of times just to clear it out. Remember, your nose and your mouth are both connected to your throat. So right. if it, it, it's leaking into your throat, it's leaking down towards your trachea. So, you know, it, whatever, just time permitting. Most of the times, like I said, we're more worried about the rigid one than we are the uh, flexible one. Okay. Um, so again, the flux and flexible suction catheters are not good for thick stuff like vomitus or anything like that. Sometimes they kink or like they get twisted so it doesn't come out. So it's not so common. This is really more used in the hospital when somebody's intubated and they have that endotracheal tube. And let's say they had a bronchitis, they had a chest cold. So, you know, you need to, some of that mucus is coming up the tube and you have to get it rid of. Those things entering those tubes, those suction catheters entering into an endotracheal tube do a pretty good job with that because they just follow the endotracheal tube all the way down, okay? Okay, so if we have to measure the flexible one, we measure the same way you put in an NPA or OPA, but basically we want to go to the back of the jaw, right, and stuff like that. So we don't want to, you know, go much further than that. So they're showing you here, right, how you're basically, this is the flexible one, how you're measuring it. Okay, anytime we're doing any airway procedures here, I just have a suctioning, but any airway procedures, you have to have a face shield or a goggles at a minimum, a, a N95 mask or better, gloves, okay on and stuff like that. A lot of these slides I made up uh, pre-COVID. So now we're much more in tune to be able to use, you know, all these devices in a regular patient, okay? Okay, so when you're suctioning, a lot of times you'll turn the patient's head on the side to help you um, get out the secretions. There's always a test question that says, you're suctioning a patient who has large blood clots, large dried up blood in their mouth. Okay, what would be the right way to do that? And the answer is actually to turn their head on the side and they say sweep out as much of the blood clots you can before you actually start using the suction. Because again, if it's a thick, dry piece of blood, it's gonna just clog up the suction catheter. Now, this is always a test question. On adults, we suction only on the way out. Well, actually everybody we suction on the way out. Withdrawing is on the way out. Okay, so we only provide suctioning on the way out and no longer than 15 seconds. Kids are no longer than 10 seconds on the way out and infants are no longer than five seconds on the way out. On the way out is a very simple thing that if there's suction being applied on the way in, you're gonna stick to the tongue or the cheek and you're not gonna get it in the airway. So we wait till we get it in before we actually have suction being going through the device and then we suction on the way out, okay? And the reason on kids and infants and even really adults is you wanna be gentle is that vasovagal response, right? You don't wanna cause the heart rate to slow down, the blood vessels to dilate and make them not perfuse their brain and have a seizure, okay? So again, you put the tip or the catheter where you want the suction, 
and then you turn it on. So you're going to bring it down into that puddle of blood, then you're going to turn it on. Okay. Okay. If there's so much in the airway that you don't think you can suction in that 15 seconds, then turn the patient on the side, let it drain out, and then suction them. The reason they have these numbers of 5 and 10 and 15 is that while you're suctioning someone, you're not ventilating. There's no oxygen going into the patient. So we can't be suctioning them for an hour because there's no air going into the patient as we have the, the vacuum pulling everything out and stuff like that. Okay, So 15 seconds. Okay, Now, if it doesn't work in 15 seconds, they say here, ventilate the patient, then go back. In real life, that doesn't happen because if you were to ventilate the patient who had blood in her airway and you're squeezing the bag valve mask, what are you going to do to that blood? You're just going to blow it into their lungs. So in real life, we suction as best we can. Sometimes we'll exceed that 15 seconds, but on a test, it's 15 seconds. Okay, and we'll get as much as we can out before we start ventilating the patient because in real life, okay, you know, if you ventilate them, you're going to blow it down into their lungs and they're going to aspirate. On a test, it's 15 seconds, ventilate them for two minutes, and then another 15 seconds and so on, okay? Um, so obviously, you need to realize that when you're suctioning, you're pulling air out of the airway. So that's not a good thing, right? But it's acceptable because you have to get that fluid out so they don't aspirate it and stuff like that. And then once you're done suctioning, you want to make sure that you replace that oxygen that you pulled out. If they're breathing well on their own, then you can put them on a non-rebreathing face mask. If they're not breathing well on their own, then you can use the bag valve mask. Okay. Okay. So definitive airways, definitive care. Definitive care means the best possible way of doing it, which obviously EMTs are limited, okay, by their training into using just the oral airway and the nasal airway. So definitive training is more, or definitive airway is more what they would do in the hospital or paramedics would do in the field and stuff like that. Okay. So the EMT assists in that, but cannot do it in the, you know, in themselves. So like last night, I have to say it was, the, I got two EMTs um, from Woodbury. They were phenomenal. They were helpful. They knew how to do their EMT skills wonderfully and stuff like that. It was actually more of a pleasure, you know, to have them than the usual, you know, crew that comes from the town that, you know, I was in and stuff like that. Okay. Okay. So again, this is not anything you have to worry about the test, but they're just saying that let's say you work side by side with a paramedic all the time, even though you're not allowed to do those procedures, you're going to learn how to do those procedures because you're going to be helping the person do it. So you're going to know what to hand next, what position to keep the head in. You know, you'll know all those different things, know to have the suction available because you're, you know, all the time practicing with that. So this is one of the devices that nowadays we use. And sometimes we use this in lieu of intubation. This is called the King Airway and it's what's called a double lumen airway. And you don't have to look down the patient's throat. Basically, it gets blindly inserted in their mouth. It's a very interesting concept that these balloons are deflated when you stick it in there. And then you basically put air through here and they inflate them. But what happens is that this cuff is basically right where the tongue would be flopping back. And then this cuff is in the esophagus. There's holes right over here. So when you're putting air down, it comes out here, can't go back out their mouth because of this cuff, can't go down in their stomach because of this cuff, and it just goes into the last hole that's available, which is your glottic opening into your trachea. So they're very nice devices, multiple sizes, very helpful in situations where it's hard to intubate somebody or something like that. Okay, so... Um, you bag yes. a patient? Yeah, in so what happens... The, I'm sorry, I didn't say it. The bag valve mask, you don't need a mask. The bag valve mask, where the mask plugs into the bag valve, you take the mask off and you just connect the bag valve right here. So every breath you're squeezing into this, you know is going into the patient's lungs because every place else is obstructed. So and this is the EMT. This is the EMT. No, no, no. In some states, yes. In New York State, no. In some states, it's a yes. Okay, it's a great device. Really, no reason in the world why an EMT should not be allowed to do it. Um, but it's New York, so I'll just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> So you've experienced New York over the last, you know, couple of months. Okay. Okay. So we're going to take a break in two seconds. So just some special considerations. So if somebody has trauma, right, to their, their airway, to their teeth, to their tongue, to anything like that, right? If somebody's teeth are loose, you're not going to stick that oral airway in. If somebody's nose is broken, you're not going to stick that airway in. If you suspect they have a basal skull fracture, you're not going to stick that nasal airway in. So there's going to be certain situations where you really can't do anything but drive fast to the hospital. Just to realize that, you know, I mean, if somebody, 
got you know struck in the face by a bat or you know rode their bicycle full speed into you know a wall by accident and their face is mushed there may be not much that you could do for those patients okay now again if there's water secretions blood whatever in the airway you know you're going to need suctioning and stuff like that they may need a better airway than what you could put in them so it's either the paramedics are coming to you to intercept you or you're bringing them to the hospital okay if it's a if it's a solid object like food or something like that a toy suction is not really good for that okay so that's where you're going to have to do your manual procedures right your heimlich maneuver and, and different procedures and stuff like that to get it out dental appliances so dental appliances are dentures face fake teeth and stuff like that okay so first thing is you don't see dentures the way you saw them even 10 years ago i guess we people have more access to dentists and stuff so they don't lose their teeth. But this dentures are when people's teeth basically rotted out of their mouth, and it's a fake set of teeth that they pop into their mouth. Um, so, you know, here's the here's the concept. If you ever saw somebody without their teeth in place, without their dentures in place, it looks like you could shove your whole arm down their mouth. You, it's actually scary looking how big the mouth is without the teeth there. So, if you were to try to ventilate them with the mask and the teeth were not there is actually nothing for the mask to press up against. So most of the times when people have dentures, we'd actually like to leave them alone and leave them in place and stuff like that, okay? Um, and you know, you don't have to mess with them, you don't have to do anything, but sometimes you'll get there and their dentures will be in a little cup, a little basin cleaning for the night alongside their bed. And it's hard, I mean, the family may know how to put them back in place, but if, if you don't routinely pop dentures into somebody's mouth, it's really actually pretty hard to do. So I wouldn't bother, I would just take them to the hospital. Never take responsibility for the dentures and say, we'll bring them to the hospital. Or even if the family asks you, say, no, you have to bring them, we're not allowed to. The same thing like hearing aids, jewelry, watches, phones, computers, because if something goes missing, you don't want to be the person who had it when it goes missing, because you may have done your job and delivered it to the emergency room and they lost it, right? But all the family knows is they gave it to you. So you take no response, even medications. Don't bring anything to the hospital. You could write down the names of the medicines, the dosages, but don't take them, okay? Because if the patient, if the medicine gets lost in the hospital, the, the insurance company is not going to pay for those medicines for that patient again until that month is done. So they're going to expect to get their medicines from someone. And if you're the person who said, oh, we'll take them to the hospital for you, you know, it can, it can become an issue, okay? Um, so somebody asked, why doesn't the epiglottis close when you're using the, um, the King Airway and stuff? So the picture makes it look like it's a little further down towards the epiglottis and stuff. It's a little, actually a little higher up the way you insert it. So it doesn't close anything, you know, doesn't, doesn't close off anything to the trachea. It just closes off the mouth and the um, esophagus so that the only hole that's open is the trachea, okay, and, you know, air, air will go in. Okay, so we talked about this. Okay, with children, so pediatric, right? So kids are a little harder to manage their airway, okay? But thankfully, kids don't usually need to have their airway managed because kids usually do not get sick. So what's some, what's when they say anatomic considerations? Just the shape of their body, what's some things that may make it a little difficult? Well, their mouth and nose are smaller, so it's hard to get more air in, it's hard to put devices in, okay? We don't routinely ever do this on kids, so we don't feel comfortable doing it. Now. When they say a larger tongue, obviously a child's tongue is not larger than an adult's tongue, but they use the term in proportion. So in proportion means that their tongue, a kid's tongue fills up more of their oropharynx than an adult's tongue does. So it's not larger, but if it fills up more of the same space, right, your oropharynx, whether you're a child or an adult, then it's, it's, it's in proportion, it's larger and it's easier to block the airway. Okay, the cartilage, the rings of cartilage on the trachea that are what gives it shape so it doesn't collapse in between breaths. They're not as hard as they are in adults. So it's easier when you do the head tilt chin lift, it would be easier for you by mistake to actually kink off their airway or close off their airway. Okay, so again, they're just showing you in proportion, right, how things are. So everything's smaller. So if you want air to go through something that's smaller, it's harder to go through. That's all it is, okay? Okay, again, airway considerations and stuff like that. Just watch how much you're you know, doing the head tilt chin lift. So we said that, you know, on babies, little babies, infants under one year of age, neutral position. On kids, okay, over one year of age, 
but less than say, you know, eight years of age, which would be start to start towards adulthood, just the sniffing position where you slightly tilt the head. And then once they start getting more towards an adult sized body, you can do the hyperextension of the head, okay? Adjuncts again, play a role. Excuse me. So you always wanna do your manual procedures. So when they say manual, that's your head tail chin lift and your modified jaw thrust and then adjuncts either being oral airway or nasal airway and stuff like that, okay? So quick review. So we know the airway that compromises your mouth, your nose, your pharynx, your trachea, your bronchi, all the places the air goes through, okay? So that's called ventilation. And then when we have the gas exchange, it's called respiration, okay? So, you know, I think everybody realizes at this point, if you don't have an open airway, you cannot get air into the body. If you cannot get air into the body, you cannot have aerobic metabolism. If you cannot have aerobic metabolism, the cells of the body will start to fail, okay? Um, so somebody asked, how, do you, how far do you know how to push the King Airway? You guys are not using it, so don't worry about the King Airway so much, but there's markings on it to tell you how far to push it down, okay? So we said we have two types of airway adjuncts that we use in conjunction or along with your manual procedures, right? Manual procedures being head, tail, chin lift and modified jaw thrust. And the adjuncts we have are an oropharyngeal airway, also called an oral airway, also called an OPA or a nasopharyngeal airway, also called a nasal airway or abbreviated NPA, okay? So those are the devices. We said our first choice is usually the oral airway, but if the patient were to gag, because they were not deeply unconscious, we could go to a nasal airway, or if we know that the condition of the patient is such that they're not deeply unconscious, like they, like that lady last night after the seizure, or like somebody who's a little drunk or something like that, we may just choose to go to the nasal airway. Okay, we said the one time we cannot use a nasal airway would be if somebody has a basal or skull fracture where we see either blood or cerebral spinal fluid leaking from the ears or the nose, or bruising behind the ears or around the eyes, okay? Um, again, with the oral airway, if it looks like they fractured any teeth or broke any teeth, you don't want to use it, or if they're too conscious where they may gag, okay? So suctioning we talked about, we said we had rigid suction catheters, flexible suction catheters. We talked about how to size them. Remember, for adults, we said we don't suction for more than 15 seconds, that we always suction on the way out. For children, no more than 10 seconds on the way out, and for infants, no more than five seconds on the way out. Okay, you have to have your proper personal protection equipment, gloves, goggles, uh, N95 mask, and a gown at a minimum, okay? Um, we're constantly monitoring the airway because it could be one, good one minute, next minute can be, there can be a problem or anything like that. Um, and, um, you know, with your airway management, you always start with the basics, right? Your head tilt, if that doesn't work, okay? Then you would, might go to modified jaw thrust. If that doesn't work, you know, you add the OPA or the NPA, and usually using a combination of a manual procedure with an airway adjunct, you will get the airway open. So somebody wrote, why do we try an OPA before an NPA? NPA? So an OPA does a better job, right? What is the nasal airway? It's a flexible little tiny tube. The oral airway actually scoops up the tongue and holds it. Remember, you're doing this because somebody has snoring respirations and you couldn't clear up the snoring by doing a head tilt. So it's just that the oral airway does a much better job in keeping that tongue up out of the way than a nasal airway does. Okay, main structures of the airway. I just said it two seconds ago, right? You have your nose, your mouth, your nasopharynx, oropharynx, and pharynx, okay, or hyperpharynx. Then you have your, your larynx, which is the top of your trachea. In your larynx is your vocal cords. Above your larynx, you have your protective flap of your epiglottis, okay? The larynx goes to the trachea. The trachea goes down, splits into or bifurcates into your right and left main stem bronchus. And those bronchus get into smaller and smaller tubes called bronchioles. And at the end of every bronchiole are the air sacs or alveoli, okay? Why is uh, airway the first priority? I guess because the person who thought ABCD, no, I'm teasing. Uh, it's just, you know, that's always been the way it is, right? You have to get air into the body for the body to function, okay? Inadequate breathing would be somebody who's not breathing deep enough, not breathing fast enough, Okay, showing signs of cyanosis or their pulse oximetry is low. So we'll talk about that more when we do assessment. Okay, head to chin lift when we don't think there's a spinal cord injury and somebody has snoring respirations. Jaw thrust when we think somebody may have a spinal cord injury and they have snoring respirations, okay? Airway adjuncts play a role, okay, in keeping the airway open. So they're the like second line after you do your manual procedures if your manual procedures were not enough. Okay, suctioning obviously would be the ideal way. The vacuum would be the ideal way of getting secretions. 
okay, out of somebody's airway. There's no other way really to do it. So we had on arrival at the emergency scene, you find an adult female patient with gurgling sounds in the throat and inadequate breathing slowing to almost nothing. How do you protect the patient's airway? So the first thing is probably turn her on her side, scoop out whatever you can, okay? Then suction, okay, with the rigid suction catheter, the Yancor suction, okay, on your way out for no more than 15 seconds. And if the breathing is that slow that there's almost nothing, you're gonna have to use your bag valve mask to ventilate her. And if you're not doing a good enough job with the head tilt tin lift, to keep the tongue up out of the way and you can't ventilate them well, you'd start with your oral airway and see if that works. Okay, we're evaluating a small child and we hear Strider. Strider was that inspiratory sound on the way in that, <coughs> right? That's telling us there's either a partial airway obstruction or there's a infection or something like that. Okay, so why is it an immediate problem or concern? Okay, because it's the top of the airway. So if you can't get air through the larynx, which is the sound, the, the structure where strider is made, you can't get air into the trachea. If you can't get air into the trachea, you can't get into the lungs. So it's a true life-threatening problem, okay? And that's a rapid transport to the hospital because on a BLS level, you don't really have any way to manage it. We're assessing an unconscious patient, you note know, snoring respirations. Should you be concerned with this? Yes, and if so, what steps? Head, tail, chin lift. If that doesn't work, an oral airway. Okay, if they, they won't take the oral airway and nasal airway. If there's a possibility of spinal cord injuries, then it's a modified jaw thrust. But if you cannot get that tongue up out of the way with the modified jaw thrust, and you tried it for a couple times, you can go to your head tilt chin lift. Okay, so let's take a couple minute break. Okay, let's see what time it is. Oh my God, I went an hour and a half straight. Okay. Um, no wonder my back hurts. Okay, so let's let's. Voice yet, but you said it's going to change. What's that? We don't hear the sound in in, in your voice. You it's close. It's, it's close. I think. It's so it's interesting. We didn't even know that the time went by. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're a kind man. Okay. So it's nine twenty eight. Come back at about nine forty. Nine forty ish. Okay. And we'll uh, we'll restart. We got uh, another like equal to this size chapter to get through tonight. So. Okay, so let's uh, take a break, stretch your legs, get some water, and we'll start up again. Let me pause this and make sure to remind me to start it up again. Okay, so we were talking about the airway adjuncts. Now we're going to talk about how we give oxygen to people and how we ventilate people and stuff. Um, there is a little anatomy and physiology that we have to read. Somebody have a question? No? Okay. Okay, so um, we know that ventilation is the process of moving air in and out. We talked about that, that the part of ventilation where the air comes in is called inhalation. On a test, they're gonna ask you what is the active phase of breathing? And that is inhalation because the muscles are moving. So it's active, they're doing something. And when the muscles contract, they pull out the chest cavity. As they pull out the ribs, the lungs are stuck to it because of that adhesion we talked about when you have two shiny membranes with water between them, right? I gave you the analogy of a, you know, you have a granite countertop and you have a piece of glass and there's a little bit of water between the glass and the granite. It doesn't pull apart, but it will slide. And the same thing happens with your rib cage is that you have a lining over your lungs. You have a lining on the inside of the ribs. There's a little bit of fluid. So as your muscles contract and pull your chest out, it stretches your lungs. It makes the pressure inside your lungs drop because your lungs are getting bigger. Pressure drops more than the pressure in the air around you and air flows in, right? So that's basically what happens. So you're decreasing the pressure in your chest when you have those muscle contractions of your diaphragm and intercostals, your chest size increases, the pressure becomes lower or negative, okay? And, um, oh, hold on one second. Somebody's saying the... Is that better? Oh, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Oops. Okay. So that's basically how air moves in. Then those muscles relax. The chest cavity contracts, gets smaller. The pressure obviously has to increase because the chest cavity is getting smaller. So the pressure inside your chest becomes greater than the pressure room, uh, room around you, the air around you, and you exhale. Okay, so that's basically what happens. So again, on the test, the active phase of breathing is inhalation is bringing air in, okay? Now we had some terms, again, I don't think it's 
crazy that you have to memorize all this, but just conceptually and stuff. The tidal volume is the amount of air we bring in and out with each breath. That's about 500 mLs. We said about the size of this little water bottle, right? And again, we can increase that if we decide to start exercising or you know working harder and stuff like that. If we take that 500 mLs and times it by the amount of times we breathe per minute, that is our minute volume. So that's the amount of air you move in and out in one minute. So if you took uh, 5,000 mLs and you were breathing 10 times a minute, 500 times 10 would be 5,000 milliliters or five liters, right? Because there's a thousand milliliters in every liter. And um, that's the amount of air you could breathe in and out, or you should be breathing out in and out in one minute if you were breathing at that, you know, 10 breaths per minute. And you can also obviously increase that if you have to, okay? And then we talked about out of that 500 mLs, right? That some of it has to get stuck above our alveoli because you have a nose and a mouth and a uh, throat and a trachea, right? So not all of it in every breath reaches down to the alveoli. Okay, and we're going to talk about a second when somebody starts to breathe shallow, what's the consequence? So if somebody's not taking a full deep breath and they're not moving 500 mLs and they're only moving, you know, I don't know, uh, 300 mLs, right? So, so instead of moving 500, you're moving 300. So 150 still has to get stuck. That means instead of 350 reaching your alveoli, 150 only reach your alveoli. So that's the problem. So the dead air space is the area where there's no alveoli, so there's no gas exchange. And the alveolar is, you know, obviously where there's gas exchange. Diffusion, don't worry about it, memorizing the word, but you, I think you already all understand the concept is that, you know, just like air was flowing from higher pressure to lower pressure, so oxygen does the same thing. So oxygen diffuses from where there's higher to lower. So if, you know, if you're breathing, you know, oxygen into your lungs, it's going to diffuse across into the capillaries that are wrapped around the alveoli because the oxygen in your alveoli level is higher than the oxygen level in your bloodstream because that's the old blood, right? And the same thing, the, the, the carbon dioxide that's you know in your pulmonary capillaries is higher than the carbon dioxide that's in your alveoli, so it flows out and you exhale it. So everything moves from higher pressure to lower pressure. And then we said we had some different types of respiration, so ventilation, which is moving in air, air in and out, and respiration is the exchange of gases, right? So external, okay, is between the pulmonary capillaries and the alveoli, right? So that's the first one we've been talking about. Internal, okay, is between the blood and the cells, right? So that doesn't take place inside the lungs. That takes place every other structure in your body, right? Every other cell, we talked, we showed that picture where we had the artery and the vein and connected between the artery and the vein with the capillaries, that goes all over the body, okay? And this, sometimes you'll see a term cellular respiration, Okay, so that's kind of the same thing as what they were talking about, you know, over here with internal respiration. It's basically that the oxygen is going out of the bloodstream, right, out of the capillaries into the cells, so the cells can make energy. And then once they make energy and they produce carbon dioxide, the cells, they're giving the carbon dioxide out of the cell into the bloodstream so they could travel back, okay, via the veins so that you can get rid of it and exhale it. Okay. Now, we said that you know, we can have pathophysiology, again, being problems. We can have problems where this doesn't work, right? Most of the times it works great. You know, thank God, 100 years, everything works perfectly and there's no problems. We could have problems where there's a hole in the chest, the lungs, are, the, the, um, the ribs are broken, the muscles are not working, okay? And stuff like that could be interrupted. We could have problems with the exchanges of gases, right? That the oxygen and carbon dioxide are not leaving. Maybe there's no hemoglobin. We could have issues where there's not enough blood or maybe the heart's not pumping. So not to get into it deeply, but there's a lot of different ways that we could run into problems. But like I said, most of the times, you know, thankfully everything works the way it needs to. Okay, and we'll talk about what we do as we go on in class, you know, with all these different problems. Okay, so we know that the brain or actually every single cell in your body, not just your brain, but every single part of your body needs a constant supply of oxygen. Some need more, some need it constantly, some can get away with a little, a little less, right? So your brain is one that needs all the time. Kidneys are one that needs all the time. Your heart is one that needs all the time. Your skin, it needs it, but it could, it could last, you know, a little longer without it. So, you know, there's, there's certain ones that have a high need for it. Now, the term for a low oxygen level, okay, in the cells is hypoxia. Right, so hypo means low, and oxia is oxygen, okay? So a low level, so when somebody starts to have problems breathing or moving air or respiration or ventilation, whatever term you wanna use, 
right? And the oxygen level drops, we say that's hypoxia. And we would say the term, the patient is hypoxic, right? So hypoxia is the condition. When we're saying it about a patient, we say the patient is hypoxic, okay? Now, the same thing like we have to get fresh oxygen in, we have to remove the garbage, the waste product, okay? So carbon dioxide has to be removed. And if that's not removed, then the level of carbon dioxide rises. And that's called, that's to, uh, called high cap, um, um, hypercapnia. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm getting tired. So that again, they're not gonna, they'll use hypoxia on the test constantly. I've never seen them use hypercapnia on a test. Okay, they'll say high CO2, high carbon dioxide, but you know, just a medical term for it or correct pronunciation is hypercapnia. So hyper is high, capnia is carbon dioxide, so hyper, hypercapnia. So. Okay, so when we're assessing the, you know, how well somebody's breathing in and out, okay, we're really trying to see how well, how much, how well are they doing a job in bringing oxygen and getting carbon dioxide out, okay? So if somebody's level of oxygen drops and they get hypoxic and some of the level of uh, carbon dioxide rises, basically the body's not getting what their need, needs and it's getting, you know, kind of poisoned, okay? So we're gonna talk, I mean, how are we gonna know, how are we gonna know, again, as we go through class, we keep on reviewing, keep on going over. Just remember, you know, day one, you thought everything was crazy. By now, all the stuff we covered in previous classes is starting to make sense. So, you know, go, we'll go slow. We'll keep on repeating and we'll get it all. Okay. So you may see things. Remember, signs are something that you see in a patient. Symptoms are something a patient complains about. That's always a test question. They're going to say, you notice the lips are blue. Is that a sign or a symptom? So since you see it, you see the cyanosis, that is a sign. If they say to your patient's complaining of shortness of breath, that's a symptom because you can't see it, you have to hear it. So again, a sign is something you see, a symptom is something the patient tells you. Okay, so shortness of breath would be a symptom because the patient has to tell you. An increased respiratory rate and depth, that would be a sign. So if somebody's struggling to breathe and they're breathing faster and deeper, that's something we can see. Increased heart rate, again, is something that we, I don't know, I mean, seeing and feeling is kind of the same thing. So as long as the patient's not telling it to you, it's not a symptom. So an increased heart rate would be something, again, would be a, a, a sign, not a symptom. Okay, so the body can compensate, the body can make adjustments, okay? And the first step of having trouble breathing is called respiratory distress, okay? So the body's going to, just like when, when somebody went into shock, the body can do things to try to keep the blood pressure up. When you start having trouble breathing, the body can do things to try to make the most use of the oxygen it has, okay, and, and compensate to, to keep the metabolism, keep the cells from, to keep, the, keep the cells making energy, okay. So, so shortness of breath. So if a patient says, I can't, somebody said, is shortness of breath, uh, can shortness of breath be heard? Is it a sign or symptom? So somebody says to you, I can't catch my breath. I feel short of breath. I can't breathe well. So that would be a symptom because the patient's telling it to you. If you see that the patient looks like they're having trouble breathing, they're using accessory muscles, they're breathing real fast or something like that, that would be a um, sign, right? So if the patient tells you it's a symptom, patient complaining of something, it's a symptom. If it's something that you observe, okay, it would be a sign, okay? Okay, so when we talk about somebody breathing inadequately, okay, it's really the correct way of saying the medical way is called respiratory failure. So again, the first stage was respiratory distress, right? So that's somebody who's starting to have trouble breathing. In respiratory failure, what happens is the muscles get tired, right? Just like any muscle. If you're using your arms, at some point it gets tired. It gets tired because you're, you are using so much oxygen that you no longer have aerobic metabolism where you're making energy with oxygen and sugar, and you have now anaerobic. And again, we said the problem is in anaerobic, you're not making enough energy. That's why they're getting tired. And also you have that buildup of lactic acid instead of carbon dioxide, and that makes the muscle fail. So in the arms, big deal, you stop doing what you're doing and everything gets better. But the problem is if it happens in your intercostals and your diaphragm, you don't immediately stop breathing, but you start to breathe shallow. And that's why we gave that analogy a little while ago that if you breathe 300 mLs instead of 500 mLs, you're not getting the same amount of air to your alveoli. If you're not getting enough air to your alveoli, what happens? Your O2 level drops, so you get hypoxic, and your CO2 level rises, so you get hypercapnia or high, and the, what, what starts to happen is that their mental status has to change, right? And now all their 
organs of their body are being deprived of oxygen, the carbon dioxide is not leaving their body, and everything starts failing, right? So, but the first thing you're gonna see when somebody's in respiratory distress, which is the earliest sign, is they get nervous, they get anxious. Something's wrong, I can't catch my breath. But then as they start moving to respiratory failure, because the oxygen level is dropping and the CO2 level is rising, they start to get sleepy. And they do what's called head bobbing, which means they, they, they don't stay awake. Every time you call their name, they kind of look back up and, they, and then they go back down. So they're resting their head on their chin because they're getting tired. Okay, remember, somebody who's having trouble breathing is always going to want to be sitting up because it's easier to breathe than lying down. So if you find them lying down, that's already the next step, right? They're already worse. Okay, so here's a patient. Right, who, I mean, even now, the little we know seems to be having trouble breathing, right? And they don't show it well, but she's actually supporting some of her weight on her arms. And that's called tripoding. Tripod is three things. When you have a tripod, you have three things touching the ground. So her butt and her arms, and they do that because they can actually get their diaphragm. They're kind of pushing up on their arms, and they're actually getting their diaphragm to come a little further down so they can get a little more air into their lungs, right? So it's just a way they don't, there's no book they read. It's just a natural way you find, you know, if comfortable to breathe when you're having trouble breathing. So from, from an adequate standpoint of breathing, you have a normal mental status. You have a normal pulse ox. A normal pulse ox is north of 96, 97%. Some books say 94%. You know, for usually in the EMT test, they say 96%. Um, in patient care in real life, we usually say above 94%. Um, you know, but since you're concentrating more on the test right now, so say 96, 97% is a normal pulse ox. No cyanosis. They can talk to you, right? They don't seem like they're struggling to breathe. So that's all good, adequate breathing. When we say inadequate breathing, we're saying breathing that's not good, right? So they're not moving their chest. That means they're not getting enough air in, okay? They're using their belly to breathe. They're, in other words, they're trying to use accessory muscles. Again, you can't feel them moving air. Their breath sounds are not good. They're making abnormal sounds, right? Everything we talked about before, that's all signs and symptoms, right? They're, they're starting to have trouble breathing, okay? Other things, the rate may be too rapid, too slow. Now, I know we were looking at numbers the other day, and we had 12 and 20 as being a normal respiratory rate, and then someplace else, somebody said in their book, they said if it's less than 10, then somebody else said it was less than eight, right? There's, there's no hard and fast number. It's if the patient is awake and talking to you, then obviously the number is good. And if the patient is un, not awake, then the number is not good. So if somebody's breathing 10 times a minute and having a conversation with you, either you counted wrong or they're in great shape and they only need to breathe 10 times a minute. So I, I know in a test, you want to know numbers, but in real life, you have to assess the patient and see, you know, is that number good enough for them? And they go by mental status, right? Then you're going to go by mental status. Right before we take the state exam, I'll go over all the little tricks, right? All the little things that they ask that are not really fair. Like, you know, on one question, they'll say 36 is too fast. On another question, they'll say 28 is too fast. So, uh, you know, we'll go over all those things so we know how to answer it, you know, for the test standpoint, okay? Now, having cyanosis or that bluish discoloration of the lips is not an early sign of having trouble breathing. Okay, taking, like when you have that strider, right, that, that problem where you can't get air in, so your inspiratory phase, the time you're breathing in, is more prolonged than your expiratory phase. When you're having an asthma attack, it's the opposite. It takes harder to get out because asthma is a problem with exhaling, strider is a problem with inhaling. So, and we'll cover this again and again. Retractions are where you see, that, remember that boy we were looking at and we're showing you the muscles? Well, when you see the space between their ribs actually tugging in, that would be called retractions. That means they're sucking so hard to breathe, they're actually pulling in between their ribs, the muscles, right? And nasal flaring again, when we said where the skin over here on the nose kind of flares out when they're having a lot of trouble breathing. Okay, again, oxygen saturations below 95%, okay, are usually of concern. Somebody asked what's metabolic. So metabolism and metabolic mean the same thing. Metabolism is the burning, is the making of energy. It's the burning of the sugar and oxygen okay, to make energy. Perfusion was getting the sugar and oxygen to the cells so they could burn and make it, but metabolism is the actual burning, and we said the good metabolism is the aerobic where we have oxygen and sugar. The not so good is the anaerobic where we don't have enough oxygen. We have the sugar, but we don't make as much energy as we need, and the byproduct or the waste product is lactic acid. Okay, so hypoxia is the term for, we said, low oxygen in the cells of the body. 
Some people use it also for low oxygen in the bloodstream, but it's usually really just the cells. I mean, we could go through a hundred different ways why somebody would have low oxygen, right? So that's, you know, as the class goes on, we'll be hitting them all and stuff. But if they're in the fire and there's not a lot of oxygen and there's more carbon monoxide than not carbon dioxide, but carbon monoxide, right? So, I mean, they're getting poisoned, right? Emphysema is a disease that affects people who breathe, uh, who uh, smoke for many years. Okay, so the alveoli, instead of staying open as those sacs with the rooms in them, become closed and floppy. So every time the person has to breathe in, it's hard for them to get air down to their alveoli to have gas exchange. Okay, somebody overdoses on drugs and the part of your brain that's supposed to tell you to breathe is not working. So instead of breathing 20 times a minute, you're breathing two times a minute, right? So there's a lot of different reasons. Okay, somebody's heart is, is deprived of oxygen. So it's not pumping. Well, the breathing's working fine. Okay, but the reason you can't pump that oxygenated blood around. So it's still a problem, okay? So what do we do? So now we have to judge, can we just strap an oxygen mask on their face or do we need to force it into them by like using CPAP with a bag valve mask? And, and we're gonna show you that in a second. So that's an, that's an assessment thing that you have to decide, right? In other words, if the person's breathing 12 to 20 breaths per minute and fully, but they say they can't catch their breath, well, probably putting them on supplemental oxygen by a nasal cannula or a non rebreather is fine. But if somebody's breathing two times a minute, strapping a mask on their face is not helping because you need to raise the amount of time they're breathing. So you need to use the bag valve mask. Somebody has overdosed on drugs and they're breathing eight times a minute, but very shallow. You barely see their chest moving. So now they're on a little bit on the slow side, but they're also, more importantly, very shallow. So you need to use the bag valve mask. Okay, so it just, it really just depends on the situation. Somebody's been struggling to breathe for hours because they have an asthma attack. They're awake, they're struggling to breathe, they're starting to get tired, okay? There, it might be better to put them on the CPAP because if you had to stick the bag valve mask over their face and time when to squeeze, it probably would make them crazy. But with the CPAP, it's sitting there waiting for them to take a breath and when they take a breath, it helps them, it forces air into them when they breathe in. So there's a lot of different toys we have, you know, things we have to uh, be able to ventilate. Okay, so when do we have to intervene? When do we have to get involved and help them? Okay, so that we said that patient and respiratory failure, which is the middle stage of having breathing problems, right? The earliest stage is respiratory distress. The middle phase is respiratory failure. Uncorrected respiratory distress goes to respiratory failure. Uncorrected respiratory failure goes to respiratory arrest. Respiratory arrest means the patient stops breathing. If the patient stops breathing, then there's no oxygen coming in and eventually the heart stops and then eventually the patient's dead, right? So it's one leads to the other to the other. So if you can intervene and start ventilating that patient, you're gonna prevent them, even if they go into failure, right? But you're gonna prevent them from going in from to respiratory arrest, you're gonna prevent them from going into cardiac arrest, okay? So if the breathing's inadequate, you have to intervene. You just have to decide by what method. And maybe the first decision was wrong. Maybe you said, okay, maybe I can put them on some oxygen, see what that does, but you don't see them improving. So you say, okay, I tried it, didn't work, right? So you're always constantly reassessing to see if what you're doing for the patient is, um, is helping and not hurting. Okay, so how do we know what signs, what things do we see a patient needs to be breathing? What do you think? So cyanosis. Or somebody's breathing shallow, somebody's not breathing fast enough, somebody's unresponsive, somebody's just laying there, right? Somebody has abnormal sounds. So, you know, there's a million different things as we start going through patient assessment, as we start talking about all the different conditions, you know, it'll make sense. So somebody asked what CPAP. So CPAP we talked about is the device that a patient who has sleep apnea uses where it kind of forces air into them when they breathe in on their own. So it's something that's useful on a conscious patient, not an unconscious patient, because they have to be wanting to breathe on their own. And, and we're gonna practice with it in class when you do skills. I think I have a picture of it over here. There's all different kinds, obviously. But it's just a, it's, it, it, a, and a patient who's conscious and having trouble breathing, it helps them to take a deep breath, right? So that's what it basically does. Okay, so the term positive pressure ventilation means that we're forcing air into the patient. That's not a oxygen mask. That's not a nasal cannula because that requires the patient to breathe it in. This is when we force it into them, right? Okay, so if a patient's not breathing at all or breathing very shallow, very slow, we have to ventilate them, okay? 
So we're using force to force air into them. And the main device we use is the bag valve mask. Now, it's not without risk, okay? So when we ventilate them, if we're not paying attention on how much air we're putting into them, we could burst the lung, cause a pneumothorax, right? We can increase the pressure too much in their chest. If the pressure that we increase in their chest exceeds the pressure in the veins, the inferior and superior via cava, bringing blood back to the heart, then we're not going to be circulating blood very well, right? If we ventilate them where their lungs are full and we keep on trying to squeeze, so the only hole that's left then is going down to your stomach. So now all of a sudden their stomach starts getting bigger and they could vomit and aspirate, right? We could raise their oxygen level too high, right? Remember I said that everything in the body is supposed to be at a normal level. Too low is bad, too high is too bad. Okay. Now I wrote here, do not ventilate a patient who's vomiting or has vomitus in their airway. Vomitus is the, the same thing as vomit, right? Vomit, vomitus is the same thing. It's the you know, stuff that came from your stomach. Because if you ventilate them, it will force the vomit down into their lungs, and then they're going to have an aspiration pneumonia. So that's where you have to do whatever you can do to get it out before you ventilate them. On the test, you're going to say that you only uh, suction for 15 seconds on the way out. But in real life, we may have to exceed that because we want to get most of the vomit out before we start ventilating somebody. Again, this is obviously an unconscious patient. If somebody's awake and throwing up, they're going to clear their own airway, right? So this is somebody where they're not awake enough to be able to take care of that, okay? So we want to make sure that they're breathing deep enough. We see that by chest fall fast enough, okay? And we want to make sure that how fast they're breathing is adequate, is, is enough to stay alive. It's usually more of a problem on the slow side than on the fast side. In other words, if somebody's breathing four times a minute, yes, they're breathing, but four times a minute sure isn't 10 times a minute, isn't 12 times a minute, isn't 20 times a minute. So they're just strapping an oxygen mask on them will not be good. Okay, so we assess them, make sure they're breathing adequately. If we have to do something, we explain the procedure to the patient, okay? And then we go ahead and try to start, you know, delivering that treatment, whatever it will be. So if we're going to do the oxygen mask, nasal cannula, whatever it is we're doing, okay? This is talking about ventilating somebody with a bag valve mask that's conscious, which is talked about in your book, but it's impossible to really do it on a conscious patient. The problem is that you have to time the squeezing of the bag valve mask at the exact time the patient is breathing in. And if they were that awake, okay, to be able to help you with that and, and signal that to you, they wouldn't be having trouble breathing. So it doesn't really work. Where CPAP is just sitting there waiting for them to breathe in. As soon as they start breathing in, it's helping them breathe deeper. So CPAP's a better device if the patient's awake and breathing on their own. So CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, BiPAP, whoops, BiPAP, biphasic positive airway pressure. We use CPAP in the field. BiPAP you may see in the house, you may see little kids. So when they talk about it, non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Non-invasive means you're not penetrating the body with the device, a needle, a tube. You're not intubating them. This is just something that straps on their face, okay? Now, what's the difference between CPAP and BiPAP? Continuous versus occasional. So what happens with CPAP is the machine's always pressured. And it's always waiting for the patient to breathe in. And it's going to force it in. The bad part of CPAP is it becomes harder for the patient to exhale because it's always pressing, right? So you have to exhale with more force. And if you're older or your muscles are weak, it's hard to exhale. You can't get all your CO2 out. So that's the bad part about CPAP. The, the best part about it is it's a simple machine. We can carry it in the field. And for the most part, it works well. BiPAP is not a one-time use disposable type of device like CPAP. It's a fancy machine. It costs a lot of money. It has settings on it. So it doesn't really work very well in the field. The advantage of BiPAP is that it pressures in. When you go to exhale, it cuts the pressure. So it's easier to exhale. So it, it makes it it's pressure in when you want the air to come in, like inhalation. But when you go to exhale, it cuts the pressure. So that's the advantage of it. So it is better, OK? But it's, you know, it's just not something that lends itself to a in the field type of setting. It lends itself more into a patient's home or in the hospital. Okay, so now ventilating patients with the devices we have. So I don't know if they gave you a pocket face mask or you practice with a pocket face mask, but that's basically looks like the mask that's on a um, bag valve mask, okay, so that you don't have to put your mouth on a patient if you're ventilating. I've never used one in my life in real life. Um, 
you know, I don't know, really know anybody who has used it. I guess if you're a lifeguard, maybe, and you're not trained in the bag valve mask or something like that, but we typically use the bag valve mask, okay? But just a way to ventilate. So, you know, it comes in all different, different kinds of cases, but it's basically a mask. It's put in a, a collapsed form in there and it has a valve so that whatever you breathe in the patient, the patient can't breathe back out into you. So it just offers a, a safer way of ventilating somebody than mouth to mouth. And there's also a set of gloves in there and some stuff like that. Okay, I'm not going to go through step-by-step step how to do it. Did you guys, uh, if you didn't do it yet, you'll be doing it soon in class. It's better to practice it than it is just to talk about it and stuff like that. So we don't, we don't have to worry about that. But you're seeing here, this, this uh, pocket face mask has an oxygen inlet. So you can be giving patient oxygen while you're ventilating them. The guy's kneeling on the floor by their head and he's holding their jaw, doing a head tilt chin lift. And what he does is basically breathes in just till he sees chest rise. Then he breaks, breaks the seal and lets the patient exhale. I'm mean, not breaks the seal, but takes his mouth off it, lets the patient exhale and then gives the next breath. Okay. It's actually much more tiring, okay, um, for you. You know, in other words, uh, because not only, you know, not only are you doing something for the patient, but you're using your own oxygen. So it definitely is a little more tiring, especially if you have to do chest compressions and ventilate, it doesn't really work well. So somebody asked, how does the CPAP, how does it load a carbon dioxide? It doesn't stop them from exhaling. It just makes them a little more difficult for them to exhale. So again, unless the patient's real old or real tired, it doesn't usually interfere to that point. You know, But again, you have to monitor the patient. If they start getting sleepy, then maybe it's not the right device for them. Now, the main device we use to ventilate somebody is called the bag valve mask, okay? Because it has a bag, it has a valve, and it has a mask. That's the only reason it's called that. And that's typically abbreviated BVM, right? So BVM, okay? And it's the main device that everybody in hospital, whatever, you know, the field, everybody uses to ventilate a patient. It comes in multiple different sizes. You should probably have about four sizes. You should have a newborn, an infant, a child, and an adult, okay? And the size basically is how much volume so that when you're squeezing this, obviously it's forcing air. So there's the bag, there's a valve that makes the air only go this way. And when a patient exhales, it doesn't mix it back into the bag, it vents it out before it gets into the bag. So you're not diluting the oxygen in the bag with the patient's own exhaled airs. It has a reservoir that when you turn, when you connect it to oxygen, first it fills this bag, then it fills this bag. When you squeeze this bag, it draws the oxygen from here, not from the room air. But it does, if you do not have oxygen going into it, it will still inflate from the room. It's just the difference of giving between 21% oxygen that's in the room versus 100% oxygen that's in the oxygen tank. Okay, the bag itself is self-refilling, which means that after you squeeze it, it automatically re, re, um, you know, relaxes back up, even if there's not oxygen coming into it. So it's just a, the property of the plastic rubber that it's made out of and stuff like that. Okay, we don't clean them anymore. They're all disposable, one-time use. You throw them away. Years ago, they had to be cleaned and stuff, but you just toss them away now and stuff like that. There's a valve, okay, that lets oxygen go into the patient, but when they exhale, it doesn't miss with carbon dioxide. That's called the non-rebreathing valve. Okay, and then you have the oxygen tubing that you could increase the amount of oxygen going into the patient by having uh, the bag valve mask hook up to an oxygen tank. Okay, when we're hooking the bag valve mask up to an oxygen tank, we usually run it at a minimum, the oxygen at a minimum of 15 liters. So there's settings on the regulator, usually going from two to 25. So we typically do 15, which is enough to inflate the bag, but not to waste oxygen. Okay, so when you squeeze the bag, the valve opens and lets air into the patient. As soon as you stop squeezing, it lets the patient exhale, but it doesn't let the air come back into the bag. It vents it out to the room, okay? So it's, you know, it's a good device. I mean, it works really well. And we're going to practice in class both two rescuers doing it, one rescuer, you doing it by yourself, you and a partner doing it and stuff like that. The best way to use the bag valve mask is where one person has two hands on the mask wrapped around the patient's face and somebody else is squeezing the bag valve mask. The problem is if you're doing it by yourself, you can only have half the mask have a hand on it because you have to use the other hand to squeeze the bag valve mask, okay? So uh, there's two ways you have to know both, but it's definitely better to use a uh, two person. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip through this and see if there's some pictures coming up. So this is them doing it 
with a actual modified jaw thrust, right? So they have one guy doing a modified jaw thrust, okay? I don't know if the head's perfectly in a neutral position, but they're doing a modified jaw thrust. Somebody else is squeezing the bag valve mask. There's gonna be a test question saying, how do you know when you're ventilating somebody with a bag valve mask that you're delivering enough tidal volume, enough air into the patient? And that's when you just see the chest start to rise. Very good. Good, okay. Um, I don't know, somebody just wrote, why is the R-E-S-O? I don't know what that means, but just write it out a little clearer. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through the steps because it, like I said, it's better to, um, better to practice it, okay? Um, some patients you will find have a surgical opening on their neck. They have a hole in their neck called a stoma, okay? I think I have it over, yeah, stoma, S-T-O-M-A, okay? What it means is that they were smokers, okay? And they got um, cancer in their larynx, in their voice box. So they had to cut that out. So they had to cut the connection between the mouth, between the throat and the, the trachea out, right? And what they then did is they actually took the trachea and they connected it to the outside of the skin. And now instead of breathing through here, the patient actually breathes through here. So if this patient was in respiratory arrest and needed to be ventilated, if you were to put the mask over here, it may not work. So what they're gonna say on a test is that you first tried to ventilate okay, by putting it over the mouth and with your hand or a piece of plastic closing off this opening. If that doesn't get chest rise, then you put the mask, you know, you put the bag valve mask here and you ventilate and see if that gives you chest rise. So you get the concept. In other words, really the tube is connected to here. The problem is that some people have no connection as far as air goes up to here. They just have the esophagus connected for food. You have no way of knowing by looking at them. So you try it. If it doesn't work, then you know it's, this is the only way air goes in and you ventilate through here. Is the stoma the same thing where they do uh, tracheostomy? Is the stoma the same what they do for the trach when people are in a respiratory for too long? So, so a trach, a trach is where they make a temporary surgical opening in the neck. So you see here, there's no, there's no plastic device in here. So when somebody has a tracheostomy, it's, it's a, they need to be ventilated on a machine. So there's actually a plastic device that connects the patient to the machine. This guy is, doesn't need to be ventilated. His lungs work fine. He just had cancer in the pathway. So a tracheostomy is typically people that cannot breathe on their own anymore. So they have to be hooked up to a machine. Okay, so you'll see a piece of plastic sticking out of their neck that the bag valve mask hooks up to or the ventilator hooks up to. This guy, once they cut out the cancer, he was fine and they, you know, now it's just a, a question that he has to breathe through here. Now, one of the things that he's missing is that his air doesn't get cleaned, right? His air doesn't get moisturized. So it's not perfect, but obviously it's better than dying. So, I mean, they do have issues, but it's, you know. When you say that you try first um, bagging through the mouth, mm -hmm. isn't the air gonna escape through the hole before it gets down? So this is the issue. Sometimes it's a complete stoma, which means there's no connection Sometimes it's partial. So you have no way of knowing. You're absolutely right. If I had this patient, I would go this way first, okay? And you know you're gonna get air in because the trachea is right here. It's actually gonna be easier to ventilate this patient here than it would be here, okay? But on a test, they usually say, try to mouth, close over the hole. If that doesn't work, then go here. I don't know why. that's what they have. I'll show you, you know, questions on the test and stuff. I got one question on that. Mm -hmm. If you put something over that hole in his throat, mm -hmm. the ear is not going to go, it's not sealed tight to whatever. There's no pipe, or maybe there is, I'm not sure, but the ear is going to go inside. And what did we learn the other day that the ear goes into the, uh, not into the lungs, but um, shoot, I forgot what it's called. The esophagus. Right. It pushes the lungs to the side. Um, I forgot it's called a pneumothorax. Something like that. So it's not really sealed. So if I put something on top of that hole, it's not going to be sealed. Is that going to cause a problem? Or I guess it is so, what is it? So again, remember I told you there's real life and there's the test. Okay. Yeah. So in real life, you're absolutely doing what you're saying, which is you're going to ventilate through here because right below this hole is the trachea. It's actually sewn to that hole. So 
everything, like if, if a fly was to fly in that hole, it would go right into the patient's trachea and down into their lungs. You know what I'm saying? Like that's the problem with this. This is an actual complete opening into, um, you know, the patient's lungs. So you don't see it that often anymore for two reasons. You don't see people smoking as much, except in the Jewish world, but you don't see people smoking as much. So you don't see people getting cancer of the larynx as much, right? So this is really a specific type of cancer um, where they have, you know, cancer of their larynx, the top of their um, trachea. And um, that's one reason that, you know, the, the, the second reason is there's, you know, they, they now can do like surgeries where they spare, like they can do radiation, they can do chemo, kill the cancer and spare the actual structure. I haven't seen somebody with a stoma, you know, that's like 50 years old. I've seen people with stomas that are 80 years old and still hanging on because they got it done when they were younger. So, but you don't see people with this as much anymore. But if this was the situation, you would uh, ventilate through here, okay, in real life. I'm just saying just on a, a question. Test. Mm -hmm. Does this mean that you only have to ventilate, you only have to... Uh use the BVM uh, like, like where you got a direct line in? Nope, you're still gonna use the mask. You're not sticking the end of the BVM in here, if that's your question. You're still gonna have the mask sitting right over here. I don't, I don't know if that's- I understand. Uh, no, okay. I'm talking about the volume. Oh no, so great, that's what I was actually gonna say, but thank, that's a great, a great point. I was just gonna ask you a question, not you particularly, but the whole class, and say, do you think you have to squeeze the bag valve mask as forcefully when you're ventilating through the stoma as when you're using the mask over the face? And the answer is no, right? Because you don't have all this area to push air through. You don't have a problem making a seal as much, right? So you're absolutely right if that's what you were getting at, that the amount you have to squeeze the bag valve mask is probably 25 to 35% less. So it's really just a gentle little puff because you're right at the, you know, the trachea is right there. So mostly everything that you squeeze is going right into the patient's lungs. That's a good question. Somebody asked, why is a reservoir and the bag valve mass necessary, right? So you have the bag and then you have the plastic bag hanging off it. It's just to make sure that 100% oxygen is filling up the bag that you're squeezing. So in other words, the oxygen tubing is filling the reservoir with 100% oxygen so that when the bag has to reflate, it's drawing it right from the reservoir and it's not mixing it with room air. It's not 100% necessary. Like if you show up on the scene, with a bag valve mask and you're it and you don't have time to assemble your oxygen tank, it's better to ventilate the patient with 21% room air, just like we're breathing right now, than it would be to waste time trying to hook up the oxygen tank if you were totally by yourself. But, you know, once you have enough people to help you, then absolutely you would do it. Why okay. even try to put it in my mouth? I'm sorry? Why even try to put it in my mouth? Okay, test question versus real life, remember? So real life, we're gonna go through the neck. Just that, think of that for tonight. And then when we get to the test, you'll see the question, it'll make more sense to you, okay? Okay, again, how often you have to ventilate, how deeply you have to ventilate, okay? Depends on um, the patient's, you know, tidal volume. In other words, did you see chest rise? You see Sears is unable to artificially ventilate through the stoma, seal the stoma, ventilate through the mouth and vice versa. There's always these kinds of weird questions. So what they basically say to you is, you know, you were trying, you had a patient who had a stoma, you're trying to ventilate through the stoma, you can't get chest rise. What do you do? Well, then you seal the stoma, and you ventilate through the mouth. And then they'll ask it the other way. You know, they'll say, you know, you were trying to ventilate through the mouth, okay, and nose with the bag valve mask, and you can't, uh, you can't get chest rise. Well, then you don't do the mouth and the nose, you ventilate through the stoma. Do you have to seal the mouth in? So then they'll have another question, right? In real life, no, but they'll have another question that says, Okay, you were ventilating through the stoma and your partner says that he feels air coming out the mouth and nose. What should you do it? Then the answer is you seal the mouth and nose, but it's not usually that way because, let me find it again. It, in a real patient, the only place air has to go when it goes through this hole is down into the trachea. It's not coming back out over here. But it all depends if you see chest rises or not. Exactly. If someone has a beard and, and air is coming out, uh, exactly. you have the same problem. Exactly, but I'm just saying in real life, Again, you're not gonna see this probably anymore. I mean, let me ask you, we got what, 35 people in class? Has anybody saw somebody walking around with a hole in their neck? Maybe one or two of you, right? But I mean, it's not. I'll tell you the weirdest thing, right? The cause of this was smoking, okay? What you will- Smoke out of that hole. Yes, thank you. I don't know who just said that, but yes. So the reason this guy has a hole 
in his neck is because he has cancer because he smoked 10 packs a day. They're so addicted to it that they will actually stick the cigarette in it and smoke through it. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah. it's crazy. I'm just telling you, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really, really crazy. You're too anti-smoking. I agree <laughs> with you. It's, it's unhealthy, but not everything is caused by smoking. <laughs> you're right. Um, you're absolutely right. Okay. I'll tell you, I get the most satisfaction on a class when people tell me they stop smoking or they eat better and exercise. Okay. This device. I don't you... my, my habits uh, <laughs> after going through the anatomy and physiology and the study yep. of the metabolism. Oh, the best one is, I mean, I don't know if we'll have time because we're not in class together, but I have an autopsy video of somebody who died of lung cancer. And when they cut this guy's lungs out and open it up, it looks like this black, like if you had an air filter in your house that you didn't clean for two years, that's what this guy's lungs look like. And it's full of cancer. And they point out what the cancer is. Can but we you, see it? I, again, the problem is you can't show it. It's not, doesn't work well on Zoom because of the internet connection. You know, I mean, you have to have a super lightning fast internet connection. But I mean, maybe we'll, you know, if things calm down, we'll have a night where you could do it or I'll give it to Dovid and Yankee to, but it can't be a class. It has to be like whoever wants to come one night sees it because we don't have any free time in class to be watching TV and movies and stuff. Okay, so here's one more device to ventilate a patient that you're never gonna see, but just in case it's on the test. So flow restricted oxygen powered ventilation device, big, a lot of big words. It's basically, let me just show it to you. It's a a valve right here. I don't know if you can make out over here, there's a little trigger, that's what he's reaching for. And you see that there's a big heavy green tube that goes directly to the reservoir as a high pressure. So what happens is that when they press this down, it forces air into the patient like you cannot believe, like you could inflate a balloon in you know two seconds. So the reason we don't use it anymore is it caused a lot of damage to people's lungs. But as far as actually being able to ventilate anybody in the world, this device could ventilate anybody because it's pressure. It's like, I don't know how to describe it. Like, a, like you're filling your car up and you have the, you know, the compressor going. That's what it was like. Okay. So nobody uses it anymore. Okay. But it's a, it's still a device that you could buy, but nobody, I've never seen anybody use it in real life. So it's, it's very high pressured. Um, you know, type of device to be able to use in a patient. But I'll just show it to you. It, I've never seen a test question on or anything like that, but just, you know, so we cover everything. Now, eventually- Is it legal, is it legal to use today? Again, let's put it this way. If you hurt the patient, then obviously it's not. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a device that's out there, but nobody really uses it. Now, a ventilator is a device that breathes for a patient who cannot breathe on their own. So there's big, fancy, huge ones in the hospitals and the nursing homes. And we actually have one that's about the size of a laptop where it has you know, one port that oxygen comes in, another port that goes to the patient. And th what a ventilator does is you set the respiratory rate, how many breaths per minute, and the tidal volume, how much air, and the machine. So if you tell it to breathe 12 times a minute at 500 mLs, so it will breathe 12 times a minute. And every time it breathes for the patient, it'll put 500 mLs into the patient. So it's like a bag valve mass that you're not controlling and it doesn't have to, and, and it really only works on an intubated patient where there's a tube to hook it up to. In other words, it doesn't work with a mask. So it's, a, you know, if you were doing a long distance transport and a patient's intubated, it's the way that you would, uh, you know, would ventilate a patient. Again, it's not on a BLS level, it's, you know, on an ALS level. So it basically has the oxygen coming in. Okay. And I have no idea why there's two tubes coming out. Uh, that I've never seen before. Usually there's one tube coming out. And you can see it has breaths per minute, okay? You have adult and child as far as how long the, it takes to, for the air to go in versus the air to come out. And then you have the tidal volume, right? So that's the three settings on it. They put a quarter on it for good luck. No, they put a quarter on it just so you can get an idea of how small it is. Um, and there's all different size ones and everything like that. But I'm just trying to figure out why there would be two tubes going out that I don't, uh, that I don't understand. Unless it's for two patients, I don't know. So, okay. Probably has a gauge on the other side. Uh, I don't know. Pressure gauge? I don't know. I don't know. I've never seen this one actually, but I don't know where it goes to. Okay. So now that was people who were not breathing well on their own and we had to force air into them. Now we're going to talk about people who their tidal volume is good, but their oxygen level is not enough. Okay. So we can give them what's called supplemental oxygen, extra oxygen but they're breathing deep enough that they could suck it in, right? So we don't have to worry about forcing it into them. So just some concepts is that I've always told you 
you know, we're designed to have a certain level. So too much is bad, too little is bad. So always consider oxygen to be another medication, right? And too much oxygen can cause harm, okay? So, you know, you wanna gauge the amount of oxygen to the patient. So if somebody tells you, I'm having trouble breathing, but their pulse, ox pulse oximetry number is close to normal, you're not gonna say, well, you can't have oxygen, but you're not going to give them a non-rebreather. Maybe you're gonna give them a nasal cannula and instead of running it at six liters, maybe two liters. So this is all stuff that you're gonna learn in the next 10, 15 minutes, because I'm falling asleep. And we're definitely not gonna to get to finish this, this particular presentation, but we'll get through uh, the first device and then we'll call it a night and we'll pick up again on Thursday. So this is all ex time and experience, right? The more time you have in this, the more experience and more comfortable you feel with all this stuff, okay? So we have different ways we do it, okay? It's all lightweight stuff, all easy to use, okay? So we have different size oxygen tanks. This is a D tank, this is an E tank. We'll talk about all the different, uh, just talking about how much volume is in there, how much oxygen is in there, because remember, you know, depending on how long you're gonna be with the patient, you need, may have need to have a certain size tank. These tanks are pressurized to between 2,000 and 2,200 pounds per square inch, which basically means they can explode. Uh, they're very high pressure. So you can't put all that pressure into a patient. It's too much pressure for a patient to uh, handle. So there's a regulator that hooks onto the tank that takes the pressure and brings it down to a safe amount to flow into the patient. Okay, so we'll show that. So obviously in the ambulances, they have much larger tanks that will last much longer, okay? So a D cylinder is the main cylinder that we um, carry, you know, into a house. An E cylinder is a little bigger, right? You know, than an, uh, a D, but that could also be carried into the house. They're small enough. So it says that's 350 liters of oxygen. When you're adjusting that regulator, you're telling how much liters of oxygen you want to flow into the patient based on the device you're using. So let's say a non-rebreather, you could run at say 10 liters per minute. So if you had a non-rebreather at 10 liters, and it's 350 liters, that means you have 35 minutes of oxygen to give that patient before the tank will run empty, okay? You know, here you have 600, uh, say uh, 62.5 minutes, right, to run into the patient. Well, what? it's probably a little less, it's probably yeah. a little less than 35 because the last 200, you're not, you're not supposed to. Yeah, use, right? yeah, I know, I know. I'm just saying if you're just using the math. So, so, you know, just to give you a rough idea, you know, now, when do we use these small portable cylinders? Only when we're in the house. So again, you should never be in the house for 35 minutes. So, and we have more than one, so it's not usually an issue, but you know, you're just you're really just using it to move a patient from the house to the ambulance. Once they're in the ambulance, you're gonna hook them up to the much larger tank. So you see here, the M cylinder has 3000, right? Um, all these new fancy ambulances cost, you know, 150, $200,000. They actually have two tanks in them, two big, huge tanks in them. So, you know, the, it could be a month, two months before anybody has to switch out. These tanks are so heavy that they actually, some of them have a built-in lifting system. So like this one looks like it's a built-in lifting system. You press a button and it actually lowers the tank to the ground and they use a hand truck to move it. Some people actually have a special hand truck that has a crank and it actually lifts the tank into position because these are, you know, these tanks could be, you know, 100, 150 pounds. These are steel tanks. Okay, and again, they have even larger ones and so on and so on. Now, the test is not gonna ask you how many liters of oxygen, you know, are in a, uh, you know, in a tank or anything like that. So, you know, I've not seen those kinds of questions in years. I'm not gonna say uh, how many liters, what size or anything like that. But just so you know, you know, last thing you wanna do, you know, is be on the Amazon. Somebody says to me, you know, pass me a D tank. And you're looking at them and saying a D tank? What's a D tank? Well, a D tank is the, you know, the most common size that we use. Right. So just again for knowledge, so you don't look like you, you know, you have no idea what's going on. Okay, so there's gonna be the regulators, they down the pressure, there's tubing that brings the oxygen. Do you think what this letters are stands for? Just sizing. The the letters don't mean anything. They just had to pick like, you know, as the as the letters go further into the alphabet, the tanks are bigger. I've no I mean, not as far as I know, there's nothing. Like why did it start with A? I don't know. You it's know. not even going in the alphabetical order. Yeah. I don't know why they, you know, did it that way or anything like that. Okay, so this is not a big deal, but like the wrenches here, they're saying you're not you're sp not supposed to use wrenches made of iron because iron and oxygen can combust. But nobody, we don't have that. Years ago, 
there were wrenches made out of pure iron, but now everything is you know steel or aluminum, so you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so there's where because of the pressure where two pieces of metal meet, there's always going to be a soft plastic uh, regulate. Um, I'm sorry, gasket, so you can compress it. I'll show you what that means when we practice and stuff like that. And you know this is not something we have to worry about. You know medical grade oxygen versus commercial um, construction oxygen. But you know when you're running a welder, there's oxygen, but it's not medical grade. Medical grade is pure. So, but it's not anything we have to really worry about. But you know, just to realize there's could be two tanks, um, but a medical grade oxygen tank is always has green on it. So if you see like these tanks, it's green, right? Even the silver tanks, the top is painted green. So that's medical grade oxygen. Um, I'm not going to go through every step because basically you have to practice them. Um, there is a date stamped into every tank. They have to be pressure checked to make sure they're not going to explode. So there's a date stamped on them. So, you know, just if you ever see, oh, somebody says I had to take the tank out because it's past the hydrostatic date. It just means that um, the tank hasn't been properly checked and stuff like that. Just remember it, it's not it going to explode like a bomb, but because it's super pressurized, okay, you don't want to let it drop or anything like that. And then obviously oxygen, to, to have a fire, you have to have oxygen, right? When you're burning a piece of wood or you're making a fire in your car or you're making a fire in your furnace, right? You have to have the substance that can burn, but oxygen is the catalyst that makes it burn. So you never want oxygen flowing around a flame because it will make that flame burn better and bigger, right? So there's no, that just doesn't mix. There's never oxygen, okay, and a flame together or anything like that. Okay. If that thing falls, would it blow or would it like shoot? Like so the danger, the danger is actually, okay. So the tank's very rarely rupture it. The only way you can rupture a tank is over, overfill it. And you don't fill a tank standing around. It goes in a blast, uh, a metal blast um, tube. So that if it blasts, it blows up inside the tube and it doesn't, can't hurt you. The danger when they fall is that you, this piece is called the stem. This actually screws into the tank. And the danger is that if this cracks right here where it screws in, this will come shooting out this way and this tank will go this way. And they'll both be traveling like, you know, 100 miles an hour and it'll go right through you, you know, so that's the danger. Um, they don't fly in a straight line, they tumble. Um, and you could probably go on YouTube and, you know, look for a, you know, an oxygen tank explosion or oxygen tank uh, rupture. It may not be truly oxygen. It may be like, you know, you ever see those tanks that have, um, you know, the welding gases on them, they're all just pressurized, to, you know, huge amounts of pressure. So it doesn't matter what's in the tank. It's just the pressure that's the danger. So um, I've never seen one. I had an ambulance that caught on fire on me on 17. Um, so we got the most expensive stuff out and we walked down the road and uh, then the oxygen tanks, you know, blew up. Now, again, they blew up because there was a flame from the fire and the heat overpressurized the tanks and exploded the tanks. So that's what kind of happened to it. But we never leave a tank standing up, okay? And we'll go over all this when we do safety in class and stuff like that. Why isn't it square? That's a good question. Uh, oh, I think it has something to do with round handles pressure better than square. Like you have the seams with a square. So I think it's the roundness somehow it handles the pressure better. Because when these tanks blow um, at the bottom, they don't usually rupture here like along here, they blow out at the bottom or they blow out at the top. So I guess because that bottom's probably welded on or I don't know, you know, the whole thing, but they don't, you don't typically see a hole in the side. You know, they usually blow at the bottom or blow at the top. So, but listen, I've never had a student blow up an oxygen tank. Just don't leave them standing up, right? Always lay them flat, make sure they don't roll off or anything or anything like that. Okay, with no problem. Um, again, you have to have some type of device that the pressure goes into, and then you could administer it safely to the patient, okay? So, you know, the pictures don't do it justice. We have to actually touch and play with everything and stuff like that. But I think this one um, maybe does it a little better. Like this is where the, it hooks onto that stem of the tank. So the stem would be sticking through here. The oxygen would come in here, and then you can adjust, this is the pressure regulator, and then you adjust how many liters per minute you want to flow into the patient. A lot of regulators have that high output port, um, where that green tube hooks up, like when they're showing you that positive pressure, that FROAB that I said you never use anymore. So this one takes the full pressure of the tank and sends it right to the patient because it's on 
this side of the regulator, right? Here's where it would downplay the pressure so that when it's coming out of here. Um, so that's why we don't really use them anymore. Now, it's very important that when you're giving oxygen to a patient, that it runs through a device called a humidifier. A humidifier adds fluid. When you see people in the hospital and the water's you know, bubbling inside that thing going into the patient, oxygen in an oxygen tank has zero humidity. We are not designed to breathe air with zero humidity. So the issue is that our lungs are full of mucus that's designed to catch the pollution and the mucus is all making it back out of your lungs, you know, up to your nose, up to your uh, mouth. And some of it we swallow, some of it we, you know, blow out our nose, whatever. This is a picture of a dead person where they cut open a bronchial. And the reason this person died is if you can see in here, there's mucus that dried up and it's blocking their airway. So they have an airway obstruction that wasn't anything they ate. It was because their mucus dried up. This is an exaggerated picture of a huge mucus plug that basically blocks somebody's entire lung, right? And that was their cause of death. And they, they basically cut open the lung to get it out. I mean, the, patient, the patient's obviously in both situations dead. Now, as much as I'll say to you, it's important to use these humidifiers, just like when your kid has a cold and you have a humidifier in the room and all that stuff that makes them feel better. It's very important that we give patients humidified oxygen. In saying that, nobody uses it, okay? Why, why does nobody use it? I do not know but it really is the better way to give oxygen. You'll never see a patient in the hospital on oxygen that is not running through a humidifier, okay? The ones we have nowadays are disposable. They're pre-filled with the water. You screw them on. When you're done with them, you throw them away. So it's very simple. Years ago, it was a refillable plastic cup that you had to clean. It was pain in the neck, but now they're one-time use, sterile water, you know, there's no issues and everything like that. So I'll show you how to, you know, at some point in class, we'll show how to do that. Um, we talked about the tanks rupturing. So we'll go over that. Let me just see if there's anything else. Oh, so maybe, that, maybe that was the second, maybe that was the second pipe going out from that uh, device. Oh, for the humidifier? <laughs> nah, maybe. I don't think so. I don't know. I'll try to figure it out. Just some rare problems with um, oxygen. Okay, so you may have heard like little babies and oxygen don't mix. That is true for a long period of time, okay? So you don't have to worry about it from our standpoint, okay? It's also true that we are not designed as human beings to breathe 100% oxygen. So nobody can breathe 100% oxygen for a long period of time. In other words, we're designed to breathe room air, which is 21% oxygen. So short term in an emergency, we can give somebody 100% oxygen and we do it all the time but that patient really should not be at 100% oxygen for a long period of time because what will happen is the alveoli will collapse, okay? Because they're not used to being exposed to that. When that happens, then patients have problems where they, you know, they can't breathe well. So, so I mean, these are all situations that could occur, but they never really pertain to EMS, right? We never have those situations where we're giving people oxygen for days and stuff like that. Now, okay, we'll go three more minutes and we're gonna stop, okay? We have a lot of different devices we can use. The, the device that gives the patient the most oxygen, again, this is a patient who's breathing on their own, is called a non-rebreather mask, okay? Non-rebreather face mask, usually. So it's NRFM, non-rebreather face mask. When it says rebreather, what it means is that the patient's exhaled air does not mix in with the oxygen we're giving them. So we don't dilute the amount of oxygen we're giving them by having the patient's carbon dioxide mix with it, okay? So with a tight seal on the mask and an adequate amount of ox oxygen running in, you can give close to about 100% oxygen to the patient, okay? So it's just a simple mask, oxygen tubing, straps to the patient's head, and it has this reservoir. So when the tubing's bringing the oxygen in, it actually fills this bag. When the patient breathes in, a valve opens in here and 100% oxygen comes in the mask. When a patient exhales, the valve that goes back into here doesn't let that air go here. It vents it out these two little discs on the side of the mask. So again, 100% oxygen in, the exhaled air that has 16% oxygen and carbon dioxide vents out to the atmosphere. So most of the time the patient is breathing close to 100% oxygen. This little metal band here is designed so you can press it and wrap it around the patient's nose so it makes a tight seal. So that's the main device that we use Okay, again, it doesn't use, you know, like a good picture type of thing to see it well and stuff, but it's the main, it's disposable, one-time use and everything like that. Okay. Why would you use a rebreather? I mean, is it, is it healthy for you to, to rebreathe all your garbage back? So, 
so so it's not garbage, right? I mean, think about it. We're we're exhaling and rebreathing our air all the time. It's really not. So so it's not a a big deal. But in people that need higher concentrations of oxygen, this is the device that we use. I mean, it's you know. Um, to be honest with you, I've never seen one that we buy that has two gasket on each side. They usually have one and the other side's missing. And that's a safety mechanism because what happens when the patient breathes in right now, these gaskets seal the mask so that the patient draws the oxygen from here. Let's say you weren't paying attention and the oxygen ran out. This tank now, this bag now empties. If you had these two and the patient's unconscious and you're not paying attention, those two gaskets would not let any outside air come in. So I think as a safety, they really only make them nowadays with one. So that if the oxygen were to run out and you're not paying attention, at least some air would make it in under the mask and the patient wouldn't suffocate. So, you know, so I haven't seen one, a true non-rebreather. The ones that we carry are really called a partial, partial um, non-rebreather and they they do mix a little bit of room air in. So that's why I put 80 to 100 because you're not getting true 100% oxygen into the patient or anything like that. Okay, so again, with a good seal, 80 to 100%, we, we adjust the liter flow from the regulator that's hooked up to the oxygen tank between 12 and 15 liters per minute. Okay, so again, this is what I wrote, you know, the new design allows, you know, outside air to come in if the oxygen device should fail and stuff like that as a safety, uh, safety mechanism. Okay, um, so I'm going to stop here because we're going to switch to a nasal cannula. Just one thing is when the oxygen first runs in to inflate this bag, and they'll, they'll, they should show you this during skills. I don't know if you practice with this or not yet. What you just have to do is you, you reach inside the mask. Now, again, it's not on a patient yet, right? You're filling, you have to fill this up before you put it on a patient's face because if not, they feel like they can't get any air in. Put your finger there? Exactly. You reach inside the mask and there's a little valve. You can't see it, but there's a little valve sitting right on top of this. You just press it down instantaneously. This bag fills up like in five seconds and that's it. And then you're ready to go. Okay. So the non rebreather gets filled up, oxygen's running, and then it gets placed on the patient's face. The next device we're going to talk about on Thursday is a nasal cannula that you actually put on the patient before you turn it on for a very simple reason. The nasal cannula is right, this device that goes right in their nose. It's got these two little prongs that sit in their nose. People's noses are very sensitive. So if air is blowing out of those prongs as you're going towards the patient's nose, they, it tickles them and they start moving their head in all different directions. So again, sometimes I forget and turn the oxygen on first. And if you're quick enough, nobody really notices it. And again, it depends on how many liters, how much flow is coming out and stuff like that. But, um, you know, it usually on a test, they would say, this is put on the patient, then the oxygen is turned on, where the non-rebreather, you have to have the oxygen flowing, whoops, you have to have the oxygen flowing before you put it on the patient's face. And that's just, this makes more sense because if there was no oxygen and the bag wasn't inflated, right, and you put it on a patient's face, they will feel like there's not enough flow coming out of it. They'll feel like they're suffocating. Okay, so we are, just in case I forget, we're at like slide 77. Okay, out of 109, so we got a few more that we need to go through. Okay, and we'll pick that up on Thursday. I did email out all the um, all the handouts. Okay, whoops, somebody got knocked out of class. I did email out all the handouts. Okay, and um, I guess that's it. Somebody wrote, is it a C on? Oh, is it a critical failure to what? Not inflate the mask, uh, the the reservoir? I, I would think it would be yes. I don't know what you're. So when you see the skills sheets, there's there's certain ones that are critical that if you don't do them, you automatically fail. So that's a C. Okay. Okay. So anybody have any questions before we go get some rest? What about the quiz? Yeah, I'm still working on it. So I got, I don't know, I think I'm up to about 15, 20 questions. I had to write a lot of new questions because I didn't have a lot of questions on shock. So, but I will, uh, I will get one out to you. I promise. Okay. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Everybody have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Take care. Um, I did not understand what exactly do you gain uh, with filling up the bag. So is A, B, C and oxygen. Oh, as somebody's asking when I said the primary survey, A, B, C, D. So oxygen is in the B of breathing. Okay. It would be in the B of breathing stage. 
Okay, so I took the slides off, but the 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 reservoir that's hanging off the mask makes sure that there's 100% oxygen, right? Because it's coming from the tank into the reservoir. So when the patient breathes in, they're getting 100% oxygen, where right now we're breathing 21% oxygen. So it's just a way of making sure that the amount of co the concentration of oxygen you're breathing in is the highest it can be. Okay. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I don't think I'm going to upload the video tonight because I'm going to get some rest, but um, I'll get it up there at some point tomorrow, okay? Good night. So everybody have a good night. Take care. Good night, thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, good night. Good night.